game changer? Uh, I think for me is uh, keep your menu small. Yes. Why is that important? Keep do your greatest hits. Mm. Do your greatest hits. Uh, you know any opener for big bands, right? Mm. They don't go and do like, oh, here's some new songs we're trying. No, you do your greatest hits. You know, and, and understand that you're in the opener. Like you're not the main act. So it's cool. Do your greatest hits. That's what we did. So we kept uh, the menu to like six items. I was just going to say what's yep. small. It's yep. relative. So six, six items. maybe seven items and be okay with selling out. You want to sell This out. episode is brought to you by Restaurant Systems Pro. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, chef, owner of Hill Tribe Restaurant Group, Ya Vang. Ya, you feeling unstoppable today? A uh, y- little bit, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Having Start- a rough day, are you? Yeah, it, it's been a rough last 24 hours. Oh, so. man. Well, yeah. Hopefully nothing bad happened. Uh, maybe no. you're just busy. I hope, I hope that's all the case. Yeah, b- busy, you know, and then we have you know a bunch of other stuff coming up this week, so yeah. You do have a lot going on, man. Uh like a, like a lot. You're on TV. You have a podcast. You have two brick and mortars and a pop up. Like what? Yeah, you know we have a brick and mortar coming. We have uh, Union Monk Kitchen, which is in Gray's Food Hall, Got which it. is a, you know a stall. Um, we just call it our little shop because you call it a stall, it makes it sound like a horse stall. You right. Know? <laughs> it's, uh, and then we have where we are here, which is where we do our rotating pop ups right here. Yeah, and I love it because it's unconventional. And I think the other thing that I picked up on is. You are also really grow, great at growing a brand you oh, know, thanks. and putting yourself out there and, and telling your story. So we have a lot to unpack today, man. I can't wait to dive into who you are and how you got to where you are today and where you're headed. But let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or a mantra. What do you got for us? I think uh, the mantra is the one we use for our restaurants. And so every dish has a narrative, mm. you know, and then the, the the next part to that is we say every dish has a narrative and you follow that narrative long enough and close enough, you get to the people behind the food. And once you're there, it's not about the food. It's about people. Yes, dude. And we you know, are cut from the same cloth. Keep yeah. on going. I think no, I'm and then the, the, yeah, no, no. And then the last part, we always say that food is a catalyst into cultivating great relationships. Food is a catalyst into cultivating great relationships. Dude. Uh, yes, and we, man. And, and the way that we word that is a, a friend of mine, Ming Jing Tong, he's a, um, he works with like building vision, mission, values, and goals, and he has a consulting company. And the, the reason why we worded that way was like we w- I wanted the word catalyst. I love that word because it's a spark. It's, you know, on a, on a molecular level, like what is a catalyst, you know? So you get to learn about that from a molecular level, but like even the word catalyst. And, uh, into, um, and that we, I, I really do believe that food is a catalyst into – cultivating a relationship dude you know because you can start relationship you can end relationship but what keeps relationship going is the cultivation of it have you seen chimp empire by any chance <laughs> chimp empire chimp empire it's on netflix it just recently w- came out within the past that? couple me- weeks it's a documentary that follows the story and the lives of these chimps in mm-hmm. uh the, the the jungle i can't remember the name of the jungle but it's a it's a, i'm gonna pronounce it wrong if i even try it. but the it's basically just i'm um, like ridiculous mm-hmm. videography, like mm-hmm. 4K, amazing shots. Yeah. So, so I supposedly, like these people, these these videographers, these these scientists, like live in the jungle. Wow. So, like the chimps kind of just treat them like a bird, you know? Like yeah, they're yeah, just another like, animal, oh, yeah. like those guys. Yeah. So they act the way they know would, would normally act, and these videographers are just capturing all this mm-hmm. this stuff. Where I'm going with this is that they they talk about the behaviors of the monkeys and what why they do certain things and the the act of the hunt. And going to get the, the, the monkey out mm-hmm. of the tree. So ch- chimps eat monkeys. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not as cute as everyone thinks. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone's like, oh, cute chimps. I mean, nah, man. But the, the whole process mm-hmm. of going to get the food mm-hmm. and who gets the food mm-hmm. and then what you do with that food, mm-hmm. it's all social. High, it's all like it's it's all basically it's how you become the alpha and mm-hmm. it's, it's who you choose to give that food to, mm. to manage your, this is where I'm going with all this. Mm-hmm. It's, it's ba- and why I'm saying chimps is because we know we, f- we share 98% of our DNA mm-hmm. with chimps. A lot of what they do in the jungle is what we do in business. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like they, they it's exactly will, why I throw poop at people. <laughs> yeah. But I guess, <laughs> I guess exactly. what I'm saying is like, if you study no. anthropology yeah. in the study of us and human yep. behavior and just animal behavior, mm-hmm. there's a lot of overlapping things mm-hmm. and, um, they are very selective about if they kill a monkey, who mm-hmm. they give the food to. They're, they're mm-hmm. growing social ties mm-hmm. and they're prioritizing the hierarchy. And I'm not saying that's what we do in hospitality, mm-hmm. but there's a level of truth there with, mm-hmm. with how we treat food mm-hmm. and how we've treated food over time. And I think we can learn a lot 
by like looking at our past, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're right behind every great restaurant. It's a great person. Yep. And that, that's where the story is. Yeah. And you know, that's what monk food is about. Yeah. You know, what we say with, with monk food, we always say our, our cultural DNA is intricately woven into the foods that we eat yeah. as monk people. So if you want to know our people, you got to know our food. I love it. Our food tells the story of our people. Yeah, man. Uh, I think we're going to really, I know I'm going to really enjoy this conversation. I'm already enjoying it. So where does it make sense to start sharing your story? Take us, take us back to the um, I don't know, man. Do you, you want me to like go from the beginning or? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I know. You, so yeah, I mean, I think there, it, it's worth talking about your heritage because yeah, it yeah. has so much to do for sure with how you got here and what you're doing today. So take us back to the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I never wanted to be a cook hands down. Uh, it was just one of those things where it's like, um, I figured out when I started working in kitchens as a like teenager, I figured out like like a a system hack, you know, like yeah. for example, it's like, oh, if I put this and this together, and or if I lined up my you know my station like this, it makes it easier, you know. So it's just mise en place. Yeah, basic mise en place, yeah. kind of you know, you know, and it's like, how do I make this easier? How do you know? Uh, how do I create my you know, especially on the line? How do I create my world where I don't have to move that much? You know, so that's what I was more interested in that than actually the food. I I, I did not like working in restaurants because you basically work second shift. You would actually work when your friends play. Think about it, you yeah. know? And, and so, like, in college, it'd be, like, Friday night, your buddies are all going out doing stuff, and they're like, hey, where are you at? And I'm like, dude, working, man. And so it was, like, one of those things where I just never really was like, ugh, this job is just, uh, whatever. And it was also, <clears throat> in a way, it was a self-punishment thing because, <laughs> like, I wasn't good at anything else, you know, like, school-wise. Like, I wasn't the greatest, studious person. But it's like, yeah, I'm like decent here. I can keep up with the tickets, you know. Um, I don't think I was ever really that good of a cook. I think I just kept up with the tickets well, you know. And it's the same thing. Working the line is it's creating a system. If you can create a system and you follow that system, when that ticket comes in, then you're doing okay. And the other thing, too, is especially as a young line cook, showing up. You just got to show up. That's it. Like, There's so much truth to that. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's putting hours in yeah. and it's practice. You like, got to show up. Think about the greatest in the world. Yeah. Why are they the greatest? Because they showed up the yep. most, and they put the most practice mm-hmm. in. And, yeah, there's some natural ability that's yeah. played into that, but it's, it's literally getting the repetitions yeah. in. And in order to get those repetitions, you got to show up. So I think that right now they, they, there's this big emphasis on, like, if you're a young person, you should be, like, some, I don't know, wonderkin type, you know, like some, like, oh, yeah, by the age of 16, you should be, like, doing things that like, Eric Repair is doing, you know. And it's like, nah, man. He put 40 years in. Like, he right. showed up. And I think that gets a lot of people in trouble because they try to be Eric Repair yep. out of the gates. Yep. And they don't realize that Eric had to climb a ladder. Oh, yeah. And they, they get themselves in financial debt yep. because they're trying to, uh, like, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. I think that there's this glorification of, like, success where it's like, boom, it happens. It's like, nah, man. Like, I know, I know plenty of people who've put in that 40 years and, quote, unquote, it didn't happen, you know? And so, like, what do you do in those situations? So, for me, I learned looking back on it as a young kid, it was working in line you know, working on the line. It was show up. This is when your shift starts Go in. You know, I, I was talking at, a, I spoke at a, a culinary school and they, all these young kids are asking like, well, you know, what makes you a great cook? Like if we're a young person like wants to be cook, like what makes a great cook? And I go show up and be very blunt, show up, shut up and listen, learn, glean, you know? And so I was, I, I did that not because I knew what I was doing. I just did that as like a default. Like, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I just want to learn, you know. And um, then, you know, me and kitchen and restaurant world was kind of, it's like that relationship where it's like every like six, seven months you break up, but then you get back together like three months later and you break that back up and you're like, oh, I don't know why. I don't even, like, I hate you. And then, you know, three months <laughs> later you're like, what's going on? Like, what are you doing? You know? And I always joke about it. It's like going away to college and you break up that with that high school sweetheart. But then when you go back to like, when it's like the summertime, you go back and you're like, what are you doing this summer? Uh, right. Are you, gonna, are you <laughs> still going to work down by the pool? Like, you going to be around? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I just did that for like 15 years, you know? <laughs> because, so you did that until you're about 30 years old. Did you say uh, you were like was, 15 when you started working? Yeah. So I was like, I was 15. I did that until I was probably like late twenties, you know? Uh, but always like having other jobs in between, you know, cause it would always be like, Oh, like I, you know, so I graduated the degree in, um, interpersonal communication and minor in a PR great school to have in the yeah. industry. <laughs> yeah. Right. Minor in PR and marketing. And I wanted, I remember when I came to visit the cities cause I, I was a Wisconsin boy. When I came to visit the twin cities, I would, I saw the IDS building. And I'm like one day I'm going to be a big boy and have a real job and work up in that big building, you know? And that was kind of my thoughts, you know, like freshman year of high college, you know, coming up here. And, 
And it was just one of those things where it's like, I can't sit still. Like, I'm all still working in the big buildings, but on the, yeah. the floor level. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for the people who work upstairs <laughs> yeah. in the big building and they come and buy a sandwich. Um, <laughs> so I, I ended up um, doing all these jobs that like weren't kitchen jobs. Like, for example, uh, one job I had in college was I was actually uh, working as uh, like a child protective services, you know, with them where I would go do unannounced stops at homes of you know, people that were under investigation by CPS. And my job was like the random time I had, I had my list random time. I knock on their house and there's a safety check. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, you know, and just, you just talk to people yeah. and they know why you're there, but you, you know why you're there, but it's never anything accusatory. It's just, you know, it's grown ups who, who aren't responsible. And now they're under this investigation and I would stop in and then I would just document. No, I, I love that job because I meant I was in the car all the time driving around. I kept my own schedule, you know, uh, it, again, it was, it really l- helped me learn to talk to people. So when you talk to people, sometimes you start seeing that, look, the file might say this, it might be black and white on the file, but when you get to meet people, they're no longer a file, mm. you know, like you're, you're seeing that this mom is struggling and she's trying you're her seeing hardest. The, f- the big picture. Yep. She's you're trying just, her hardest. Not just what's on paper. Yep. And she made one decision one night you know, to either, you know, drink too much, drugs, whatever, one night, because she wanted an escape because she was like, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of all the crime. One decision, one night, and that's when, you know, authorities were brought in. Right. Do you know? Say, so so I, I started hearing all these different stories. Now, now, there are plenty of other stories where it's like, you shouldn't have a child, you know, definitely. But anyways, I, that's what I'd do. And then it'd be like when I was getting, you know, when I was like sick of that, I'm like, oh, I'll go back to the restaurant, I guess. <laughs> and it wasn't until I moved up to the Twin Cities, probably like, 11, 12 years ago. Where are you from originally? Wisconsin? Yeah, I'm a Wisconsin boy. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. You know, well, um, originally, you originally were in Thailand. Thailand yep. Yeah. So born, born in, born in uh, Vinai refugee camp in Thailand. Moved here in '88. We ended up. How moving old were you when you moved here? Four, about to turn five. And then we went out east. We moved out east to uh, Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Living with Mennonites and Amish, which I loved growing up because the white kids were like what are you and we're like we're Hmong and they're like that's weird are you Chinese and we're like no are you Japanese <laughs> really <close>. no <laughs> and then they would be like so so it was us and the Amish and Mennonite kids that became friends because yeah. we were like the quote unquote weird kids from you know the white kids and so we ended up out there until like my middle school years moved back to central Wisconsin graduated high school there went to UW lacrosse you know and, and went to college there and so eventually moved up here my mom's side the family's up here so we came up here a lot, you know, St. Paul, you know, um, East side, St. Paul, you know, so that's where a lot of Hmong families are. So we, we come visit up a lot. So I always felt like I was part of me. It was up here. So your mom's side of the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you were born in Thailand. Mm-hmm. Uh, you came here. Did your mom already have family in the States? Yep. Okay. Yep. So that was how we got here because my gotcha. grandparents were here. My uncles were here. And so they were our quote unquote sponsors. Got it. So, you know, that's kind of, in 1980, they had the uh, Refugee Resettlement Act that was passed. So a lot of the, uh, from um, the, you know, late 70s to the early 90s, that's where majority of the Hmong families came to this area because of uh, the not, uh, a lot of immigration relocation nonprofit groups were here that they opened up, a lot of churches opened up their homes, uh, you know, some like churches in the burbs, they opened up their homes and they were able to sponsor Got families it. to come over. Got it. Thanks for the, the kind of the big picture mm-hmm. backstory. So um, you, you eventually find yourself in mm-hmm. the, the Minneapolis, St. Paul area mm-hmm. from the, I give myself about like an hour or less to mm-hmm. do research. I try not to know too much because I don't want to <laughs> steer the conversation yeah, too yeah, much. Yeah, I want to listen more than yep. steer. Um, but it sounds like you were working all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yep. How many restaurants would you say you worked in from Eat. like, you know, the time moving up here and like being an on and off yeah, yeah. to like being like this is my career this is what i want to do yeah um so we i, I started out uh like for this really big like ginormous catering company right managing this small little account didn't work well there you know because it was just like you know you open up and stuff in cans and you know what i'm saying yeah yeah, yeah 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 so it didn't work well then i ended up being the church lunch lady for this really big church here called you Bethlehem. were the lunch lady Bethlehem Baptist <laughs> Church yeah so the, the lady was quitting or she was retiring because she's like 65 gotcha. right and then they had a job opening and I was go- attending church there and I'm like you know I'll 
totally do it. Uh, and it was funny because I, I met with the uh, lead HR person, Joby, and she was like, yeah, when I look at your resume, you're kind of overqualified for this job. <laughs> so our, your job is every Wednesday you put on together what's called a fellowship meal, you know, because on Wednesdays they would have kids programs and, you know, children's choir rehearsal. And so instead of the parents like going home and making food and then coming back to the church for this, um, I mean, it was a really big church, like 4,000 people, right? So it's like. Well, we create like a little what we call fellowship meal here, and you just, you know, it's like salad bar, grilled cheese sandwiches, you know, whatever. And in the past, that's what they did. And they're like, well, you can come in and, you know, like make sure that's all set up, and you coordinate with volunteers to come do dishes. So it's like little 10-year-old kids will come do dishes. Um, and then it's like once in a while, like, like once a month, there's some event going on at church, so you help coordinate, like make some, like, casserole or whatever. And I was like... You're a little overqualified for this job. And I think for me, I was just like, I just need something different. So are you like in your early 20s at this point? Oh, dude, I was like mid-20s. Mid-20s? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, I was you're, done with college you're and like everything. you like 41, 40, 48? No, I'm 38. 38. Okay. Yeah. I'm my math. I messed my math up. No, no, no. So you're about my age. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so mid-20s, Yeah. <laughs> when, do, when did you start to think like, okay, like, well, actually, just get, like, I like to use this analogy. Get in an airplane and zoom up to yeah. 30,000 feet. Yeah. We're flying over your life. Yep. We're, we, we see it, but we're not getting into any of the details. Yeah. So just kind of take us along the stops, like the, yep. the, the route. Do that for me. Yeah. So, so, so this is kind of part of it, right? Okay, yeah. So we, so I, I become really good friends with one of the pastors. He, his title is uh, Pastor of Neighborhood Outreach. So basically, in a weird way, he's the party pastor. Because how, how do you reach the neighborhood, right? Is in, you know, this is in South Minneapolis. How do you reach a neighborhood? Well, you put together the events. So, he, so one day, so if we reverse back, there was a bunch of... Um, of Bible students from Myanmar that came through. And so they wanted to do this big dinner for them. And they came to me and they're like, hey, yeah, we have an idea for a big dinner. Uh, we were thinking of ordering Olive Garden and you can just set them out for them. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I'm the new kid here, but I'm just going to say this. If you have a bunch of Bible students from Myanmar that's here and you guys want to honor them, Olive Garden is not the way to go. Right. So I go, here, here, you know, the cultures of Myanmar and the food and the flavor of Myanmar is kind of like monk food. You know, because it's in that same region. If you would allow me, let me present you a menu that we would do. So I went, you know, and I'm, they're like, sure, whatever. And so I went and I got all these things that I know. And I read up on, on Myanmar, you know, culture, food. It's basically kind of the same as Hmong, you know, kind of in that region. <clears throat> so I made all these things and I presented to them. And they're like, oh, wow, this is actually really good. And then through that, one of the pastors, uh, Ming Jin Tong, who we we're like really good friends now, he like ran in. And I like, came into the kitchen that afternoon. He goes, dude, are you the new guy? <laughs> and then he kind of just like hugged me and goes, can we be friends? <laughs> and because that's what he's been always trying to do. You know, right. he's, you know, he's, his back, he's uh, Taiwanese. So okay. his background is like, this is like food. It's a, per the church a hundred years ago was called the first Swedish church of, you know, whatever. So it's a predominantly white church. And Got he goes, it. I feel like I'm so heard through that. We started doing these things where it's like, Hey, we they, they did this thing called crowded house where it's like, we take the back uh, yard of, you know, uh, uh, like one of the church members' house, and we turn it into a pop-up. But nice. at that time, we didn't know it was called pop-up. Right. So one time, we are like, hey, let's just make a big, like, cauldron of pho back here, and let's just do that. Were you selling these things to raise money? So not really. Okay. Um, so my salary was covered by the church, you know, and then we were able to. And all we charged was five bucks. That's just to get in. The cover, okay. And that that five dollars literally covered the food and the drinks. Got it. That's so you weren't it. trying to profit. You're just trying to throw a party and do it at a break even. Absolutely. But the point of it was was to bring the community together. Yes. So so it wasn't it wasn't like you know. And again, we're working through a church here, so it's not like we're going to make money for the church. No, it was everything was already budgeted, and the food needed to be covered. So five bucks at about 250 people that shows up. And takes over a backyard, especially in you know South Minneapolis, where you know where not a lot of people gather at night. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was really cool because the neighbors would come on because what's going on? And we're like, hey, you gotta join us. So it's this idea of like we like there was no sitting room, there's nowhere to sit. We just had high top tables, and then it, for an extra twenty dollars, you can come in early and I'll sh demo the whole meal for you. And that's where I kind of started learning how to like talk in front of people, okay. you know, doing that audience thing. So all of this say is after the church gig, I got into a few of the restaurants, started working at some, you know, some of the different restaurants. At this point, are you like, this is what I want to do with my life? Nope. Or are you still trying to be okay? Nope. At this point, it's still your summer girlfriend. Yes. <laughs> at this point it was, I felt, and, and this is me being, I don't think I've ever said this on air before, but I didn't do well in Let school. Yeah. yeah. I didn't do well in school. 
I know how much my mother and my father wanted all their children to do well in school and get that postgraduate degree and like work your way up the education ladder. A lot of people who don't do well in school do really well in the restaurant industry. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I found out later. But I felt there was a part of a shame of me mm. because cause I started realizing how much they gave up for us. And why couldn't I just do well in school? So I just like sacrifice for yep, you. Yeah. Yep. And like, why couldn't I just do well in school? Like, I, I'm not, I'm not a dude that can read a book, write a paper. Like, do I'm, you have learning disabilities? I don't know. Like, I, I feel like some, may, I don't know. I never went through the quote unquote test of anything, but it was just like I just don't do well with testing. I freak out, you know. So Anxious. I just don't. Yeah, and, and and just the way that you know the school system is set up, it's very classical. standardized. Yeah, and it's, I get it. If you don't fit into the mold, you're yep. a dummy. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> like to me, I'm like, it, it is what it is, right? It's just like my father also taught us growing up that like, you don't make excuses, like you work, like you know, from a farming perspective, you work the field, you keep plowing, you keep moving forward, right? And that's always been like I'm too dumb to know when to quit, you know, and that's I get that from him, and so I've always felt like me working in the kitchen was my penance, was my way of uh, punishing myself, you know, because I didn't do well in school. In school. This I, is I, what I, didn't, I deserve. This yep, is, this, this is, is this is all you deserve. This is all you're amount to. So it was a, it was this sense of failure. You're, you're working here. You're serving people food. It you failed. Like you know all the all the quote unquote successful people. And, and this is something I've learned in the last like ten years through therapy and stuff. I mean I've learned myself. It's like now now you have to sit there. You make this food, and people who have money will come sit. The rich people, the successful people, the people who did do well in schools, all the lawyers and the doctors, they sit at a table and you sit in the back of this room and you make this food and, you, and they, it, you know, it's given to them and they buy it and they're never going to know who you are because you chose to like not do well in school. So this was this thing where I was just like, okay, this is my lot in life. This is what I'm going to do. And I remember my mom saying to me, uh, my, or sorry, my dad saying to me is that I didn't. We did not come to this country, so that we can see you work with your hands and work, and and then work in pain and suffering. And my dad would always say, "I did that. We, your mom and I, did that. So you would be able to sit at a corner office in a big high rise and sign people's checks for them and tell them what to do. That's what we want for you." Now. The Western, you know, side of Yia looks at that and goes, oh, whatever, mom, dad, let me live my own life, right? The Hmong side of Yia goes, I get what you're saying. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, no, I, I totally I, get I, it. I get what you're saying. It's, it's not a – dad wasn't telling me be better. I mean – No. I totally get what he was saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I get it because my parents worked in the restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I was three years old when they opened mm -hmm. the restaurant, and I remember having dreams of opening my own restaurant and telling them when I was like, you know – eight nine ten eleven yeah. they're like no 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 yep. we're doing this so you don't have to absolutely so like it, it translates you yeah. know for sure and and i think that that's human nature is that we want better for our kids and absolutely. i think we also don't realize how hard that desk job is yep you know and i think we think it's better to sit behind mm -hmm. a desk sometimes and i don't know if i could ever do that mm -hmm. personally i've had desk jobs i hate mm -hmm. it. i hate desk jobs i'd rather drive across the country mm -hmm. you know what I mean? like yeah. that's what i like i like i'd rather work in a kitchen yeah and have that camaraderie so i think we there's also a falsehood of like mm -hmm. you're happier if you have a desk job you're happier when you're telling other people what to do and mm -hmm. i don't know if that's true either yeah, absolutely and so uh, so for me i felt like this is fair so i'll just work restaurants work restaurants and it, it changed when uh my friendship with Ming Jin Tong grew deeper and deeper. And he was the one who really just said to me, he's like, hey, like, this is not a failure. This is where a path you're on. Like, so let's embrace it. No, Ming, was he the Taiwanese man yep. that you met? Okay. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, he was a pastor. At that time, he was a pastor of this church. And, and so he, I would just, we would just, I would just go over his house and, like, I got to know him, his family real well, his kids. Like, it's weird because, like, when I met his kids, they were, like, little kids, and now they're, like, in high school and driving, I'm like, so weird, dude. <laughs> you know, like, I used to help you tie your shoes. Now, <laughs> like, you're giving me rides to place. It's super weird, dude. Weird. Um, so I ended up, uh, we were talking, and, you know, I love the restaurant world. Don't get me wrong. But physically, health-wise, I wasn't doing well. You know, like, the whole, like, pulling these 10, 12-hour days, you know. It's like, you need to get, like, I need to get myself fixed physically, you know. And so I'm like, what, well, what am I going to do after? And, uh Tong was like, Here, here's the deal. Like, l what about you just do a pop-up? And so a friend of mine, Eddie Wu, 
Eastside St. Paul. He had this place called uh, Cook St. Paul. Uh, and Cook St. Paul, it was, it's a diner. It's a Korean-American diner. And during the night, t- during the evening time, it was open. And he just got done reading uh, Danny Bowen's book, uh, Mission. Um, uh, Danny I, Bowen put a cookbook out, Mission. It's about uh, it's about what they, how they started pop-ups. Okay. Yeah, in, uh, in the Bay Area. I'll have yeah. to check that out. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. That's kind of where, I mean, I think pop-ups have been kind Mission of Mission Chinese food. That's that what called. it is. Mission yeah, Chinese, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. yep. Uh, I think I am familiar with that, yeah. with that story. So he just got done reading that. So he's like, oh. And it was kind of this simber, uh, this just kind of like this collision of us meeting What's each other. What's the year now? 2017? 2017. So yeah. like, like five years, six years ago. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I, r- I remember 16, 17, something like that. And I remember going, hey, man, do you think we can do this at your place? Like, yeah, sure. And we start. So we got it all planned out. And then there was this food writer. Uh, her name is Mecca Boss. She's an incredible um, incredible incredible food writer and she at that time uh city pages was still going on so uh, it was a publication which is now the racket um and she's like hey i got a piece i want to write about Hmong food or you know Hmong pop-up and she's like can i do it on you and i'm like yeah dude here's the deal like we haven't done one yet we're planning on one she goes yeah that's cool let's just do it and she <laughs> calls me and literally this is supposed to be like a 10 minute call kind of like she's gonna write a little like piece so it turns to be like a two-hour conversation right yes. Those are the and best kind of conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like, so wh- um, what's the name of the pop-up? And I'm like, oh. Like, <laughs> we didn't make up a name yet, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. And so I talked to Tong, uh, and we were, like, literally at his dinner table at his house. And I'm like, hey, man, so we kind of need a name. <laughs> and we're like, it was so cheesy because it was like, uh, you know, we are talking about what's the vision, what's the mission, what's the values, and the, what are the goals of this pop-up. And I, I kind of somehow, between us, we said, like, well, you know, like, food, you un- unites people together yes you know and i'm like and we like we're like he's like let me see what we call it union kitchen and i'm like oh yeah union kitchen and we looked at each other like union kitchen yeah the reason why we didn't go union monk kitchen right away was i was still very embarrassed was that the union kitchen or no mon- union, union monk, monk kitchen oh, i got that backwards right yep. yep so uhk uh so uh so we didn't put the Hmong in there until later because i was afraid that if people white people saw the word Hmong, they're like well what kind of food is that should we even want to go and so it was Union Kitchen because it was a it was a very quote unquote white name, got it. You know, but then they're like, oh, what is it? It's, it's monk food, you know. And so eventually, so our LLC is Union Kitchen LLC, got doing it. business as Union Monk Kitchen. Got it, got it. You know, and then when we were able to put Hmong in there, a friend of mine who was a PR director, you know, a white dude, Jewish guy, he said, dude, put it in there. And I guarantee you, people will come. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know, man. It's easy for you to say. Well, I mean, I think around this time, there, I mean, 2007 to 2020, mm-hmm. right? mm-hmm. there was this crazy transformation in the American palate mm-hmm. because we started sharing. You know, mm-hmm. we had social media, and, and mm-hmm. like people became thrill seekers, like yeah. like 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 culinary thrill seekers, yep. and they wanted to try different culture. It was it was exciting to get different well, perspectives. One of the greatest things that happened to us was it was the it was the birth of you know. <laughs> Excuse me. It was like this birth of foodie influencers. Yeah. And so we were doing pop-ups. And at that time around here, like the word pop-ups, we were like, wait, what is it? You know? <coughs> Excuse me. And Fine. then what would happen is these people who are these influencers or whatever that are like juggernauts now were just starting out then. And they were just incredible people that were like loved culture. Right. And at that time, it wasn't about a clout. It was literally like... This is so cool. This is in this part of St. Paul nobody really knows about. And we're going to come in. And they weren't even coming in. He goes, hey, by the way, if I put a post up, can you know, pay me $200? Yeah. No, it was Fuck nothing. That that. It was like, this is really delicious, and I want to tell people. Yes. That's what it should be about. It, and, yeah, and, and these, you know, these quote-unquote influencer nows. And it's funny is because, like, they would never call themselves influencers, that, I, which that's what I, I respect. People call me an influencer, and oh. I was like, please don't call me <laughs> yeah. an influencer. And what, that's why I respected so yeah. much about it. And they would come in. They were like, we just want to know the story, man. Yeah. And so we started out doing like quote unquote Hmong food that you would find around here. And then I was just like, this doesn't, it's like, it's like wearing an itchy sweater, man. It's just like, it itches, it fits, but it doesn't. And I just said, look, what if Union Hmong Kitchen was the gateway into understanding Hmong food? And so at that time, so this can get more of the details. At that time, a uh, little bit of publication here and there. We were, you know, I was feeling like I was on top of the world. It was like me and my cousin were the only ones doing this. We're just running around, you know, it's super janky. My I had a 20, 
20, 2001 RAV4 at 300,000 miles that was dying. So you always play a game every time you turn it on. You're like, okay, it's today the day. It's today the day. You're, you're pushing. Put wagers on it. Yeah, yeah. And that's what. And then we put this little like yakitori grill that was like half falling apart that we bought off of Amazon for 100 bucks in the back. And we, we, we would hop from either farmer's markets or breweries and we sell little chicken skewers and be like, oh, come to our pop-up here. You know, I'm like. Yeah. And, we, and then. Part of the time during from Monday to Thursday, I would be working at Coastal Seafood. So I was a fishmonger during Jesus. during the week. And then on the weekend, I would we would hustle, you know, pop ups. And then on top of it, we would get caterings from like, um, you know, like First Lutheran Church where they'd be like, there, there's a woman's uh, like a women's prayer gathering. Could you guys make quiche and French toast for us for two hundred dollars? And we're like, yes. You know, and that, that you would hustle these catering things, you know, or or people would be like, hey, we will promote you on our nonprofit thing if you come and bring over like 300 pieces of food. And sorry, we don't we can't pay you, but you'll get, you know, you'll get FaceTime with our pe- with people coming through for this. You know, and we're like, OK, yes. And so that's what was going on. And it was great. And then uh, like a, when we first started, like a year and a half later, almost two years later, my dad had a horrible accident at work. He slipped off of, cal- uh, of a ladder. He, he, you know, he built homes, central Wisconsin area. That's where they live. He fell, falls off a, uh, a ladder and he, sh- you know, fractures his skull. Mm. He's in the ICU for about six weeks, almost seven weeks. Right away when it happened, all my siblings, who they lived across the country at that time, we all flew in and like I remember going to visit my dad. It was like a three-hour drive into Wisconsin. I was visiting my dad. I was g- in the ICU unit. I it just has this weird smell to it. You know what I'm saying? It's Hospital hospitals, smell, right? Yeah. It's dark. My dad's my hero. Like, dude fought a war, right? It's crazy. Statistically, he was supposed to die during that war, but he fought a war, lived 10 years in this refugee camp, still went back and fought for the interests of America. And, and when they got left behind by America, by the government who they fought for, he did not say any anti-American quotes. He did not. He was still saying this, this country is where I want to bring my children to because they can write their own destiny. Mm. That's his attitude. My father fought, fights, uh, fights this war. You know, his brothers, a few of them had like strokes, you know, heart attacks, stuff like that. Dad makes it through, and what? And he's laying in the hospital, and they're saying, we're not sure. Because he slips on a stupid freaking ladder. Oh my goodness. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's like an everyday. What like, were you he, feeling? Well, he, I felt super guilty because here's the deal. My parent, my dad at that time was like, like he was like a year away from retirement. He doesn't need to be in the ladder working, but they have to because they have to hustle. My greatest guilt that I still partly carry is the fact that if I would have done better in school, if I would have gotten a better job, dad and mom wouldn't have to work into their 60s. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? My, my, my siblings do the same thing. Like they, they got great jobs. They, Dude. They, you know, and it's like if I wasn't an F up and I wasn't screwing around, Maybe I could, maybe I would have had a job in one of these tall buildings, bringing in over six digits, and then that money can go and tell my mom and dad earlier, just retire early. We got it. We'll, we'll take care of all your bills. You don't ever have to worry about us. Because their whole thing was, my dad was still working at that time because he was afraid that if something happens to any one of you guys, how we want to be able to have a little something to make sure that we can support and float you. And I, and I felt so guilty. I felt so bad. Wow. So I went and visited him. The doctor said, we're not sure of his memory. So when you go in, grab his hand and say slowly, do you remember me or do you know who I am? It'll help him jog his memory to see if, you know, I remember I got in there. I held his hand. I said, hey, dad, you remember me? And so, he's, again, my dad's my hero. He's a warrior, right? But warriors aren't supposed to go out like this, right? There are two ways a warrior should die. On the battlefield, fighting hard, or two, die as an old man Indeed. around, yeah. surrounded by his descendants, yeah. surrounded by his grandkids, as an old warrior who just tells the stories of old. Do you know what I'm saying? Those are the only way right. warriors are supposed to go out. Not a freaking stupid ladder, right. dumb accident, sitting in a dark ho- uh, dark hospital room. So I'm there, I'm with my dad, and I said, Dad, do you remember when dad looks at me? He's groggly. He's got bandages over his head. And he just says, oh, I think you're my son. And he closes his eyes again. And I left. I remember driving. I still remember exactly where I was on the freeway. It was like right past Eau Claire, 94 West, coming back to here. And I just broke. Like, and my thing I said to myself was, hey, if dad dies in that bed, nobody's going to remember him. Nobody's going to know about him. He just becomes this story. Right. Like, oh, 
dang, lost my dad. How did this change things? So it's changed everything. So when I got back here, I'm like, this is no longer about, you know, getting people to know the Hmong culture and the Hmong food. It's, it's about the fortification of mom and dad's legacy. Mm. So everything we do stems from that. You know, everything we do, I bring that as like a little kid with a really messed up macaroni and cheese craft, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, art to them, even though it's not worthy of them, everything we've done is something I've offered to them saying, this is for you. Share their story. Absolutely. And that changed everything. And that, to me, changed everything, the way I cook, the way I do food, the way I everything. Completely changed. So I got really irritated when we were interviewing PR groups uh, for, to represent us. And one of the PR person, the group that we re- interviewed, the guy goes, oh, yeah, we get it. You're the, you know, you're, you're the, uh, you know, you're the guy that's like the mom and dad thing. That's your shtick. And I was just like, man, I don't think you get me. And, I, you know, we didn't go with them because I'm like, this isn't a shtick. It's my life. Yeah, bro. Like, yeah. if you think this is a shtick, then you better go find somebody else. You know, people talk about um, branding. You know, oh, you got You know, your brand is all about like the mom and dad cooking thing. That's your brand. It's not a brand, dude. Because to to say this is a brand would be disrespectful for the blood and for the tears that they've shed, for the losses that they have, the suffering that they went through. When you look at what is a brand, it's everything. Mm-hmm. It's what is culture. It's everything. Mm-hmm. It's the reality mm-hmm. of what happens. It's how yeah. you're perceived. Yeah. And that's not a shtick. That's mm-hmm. how you show up. Yeah. You, can't sh- you can't write your brand on the wall mm-hmm. and say, that's us. Mm-hmm. You, need to, you need to slap yourself on that wall. Yeah. Like, if I were to run into this wall and just be mm-hmm. mush on the wall, mm-hmm. and like what, that would be, you know, like you live it every day. Yeah. And I think um, it's, it's authentic. It's true. It's transparent. It's real. And it, it carries weight. It makes impact. And it's meaningful. Yeah. And so for, for, for me, it's been... It's been, you know, this whole idea of going back to mom and dad's table, learning the food that they made, digging into it. And while doing that, I learn their story. And by learning who they are, I'm really just learning about who I am. So I was a kid who was embarrassed of being Hmong because nobody knew who Hmong people were. Nobody knew who the story was. I was a kid growing up, too. When people asked me about being Hmong, this is what the white kids would say. Well, why are you in our country? Why are you here? And I always felt like I had to defend the position of being Hmong. Like, why am I worthy enough to be here? Why is our people, like what, we, our people had to do something big so, we're, so that we can have a mission here. Yeah. And I always felt like that's all the question I have to answer. Now it's completely changed. Now it, it's like, let me tell you about my mother and my father. And in that moment, it's not about the why are you here. It's about the connecting with people. I tell you the truth, man. Eric, I've talked to many people about who my parents are and the sacrifices they made. I don't care who the person next to the, that I'm talking to, white, black, green, blue, whatever, yellow, whatever, the, whatever that person's skin color is or where, ethnic background, where they come from, they can resonate in that. Because as humans, we know what it means to hurt, what it means to suffer, and we know pain. That stuff does not discriminate. Those emotions are real. If you're rich, poor, you're from Africa, you're from Asia, you're from Europe, wherever. We're more alike than we are different. Absolutely. Yeah. The more that, that's what I would say, that in our differences, we find out that we're actually more alike. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And so that's my big thing, man. Like, so you have this experience. Mm-hmm. You have this realization mm-hmm. that if, if I don't make my work about representing my mm-hmm. past, my parents, and mm-hmm. respecting, showing my, mm-hmm. making sure my parents are never forgotten, mm-hmm. and I, I can share their sto- story mm-hmm. through my food, through this mm-hmm. culture, you have this realization. How did you start living differently? When, when exactly mm-hmm. you were already doing the pop-ups, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. During this time. So like, yep. w- like how did this change things? Our menu, d- menu changed. Okay. Yeah, when did this happen? 2000, uh, 2017. Like so right, early, early, like early right away. 17, 18, around there. How did this, do you, how do you think this started? How did this give you more purpose direction? Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a dude. That's all about the why. What's mm-hmm. your why? Find your why and fricking just drive towards it. Don't stop. You know, be on the offensive. And so I'm, that's what drives me. Um, I learned, my dad told me the story of how they escaped Laos, right? So, you know, word comes through, America's pulling out, 1975, America's pulling out. And so he has his platoon of dudes. A lot of them said, we got to go back to our family because the Northern Communist Party is coming through and they're slaughtering the Hmong people. It's a genocide. So dad goes back to the village and he's, I said, dad, how did you escape? He goes, I had a compass and had military training. So what you do, he goes, well, I, everyone looked at me and say, help us escape. And, he, and my dad said, I took my compass. I pointed it south because I knew we needed to go south to get to the border. And I'm like, he goes, yeah, I pointed it south. And we just walked into the jungle. I'm like, was there a trail? Was there? No, there's no trails. 
and and, and at least have a machete <laughs> that's what he did he said okay. he had a machete just break, and then he had his gun with him and then his whole village followed him wow, they were like we need you to help us so he goes in and he tells me he goes some he goes i learned that you always have to keep moving and you, that you have to move forward and you have to do it together and learning that from him that done that now has become the core values of um hill tribe always moving forward together i love that we're man. moving and the movement is just not circles we're moving forward and we're moving together i love it and that becomes the core value into when we as an executive team have to make a decision are we moving forward together with this or is there do we need to take a pause and figure out where we're not jiving well it is a whole thing that it is hill it is what hill tribe is about and it was from what my dad did escaping laos man. and that is the core value of our company. And this is exactly what your core value, they should be a representation of you in like mm -hmm. your story. What do you look like on paper? Mm -hmm. I think people think of, they, they create this image of what they want to be. Mm -hmm. It's not who they are, mm -hmm. you know? And, and sometimes who you want to be is, it's not easy to reach that that facade, mm -hmm. that, that, that image of who you want to be. You're better off really digging deep in who am I? Yep. What resonates? Who am I already? What are the best parts of who I am yeah. in my story? Put that on paper. That's easier to show up to every day, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm loving this, man. We're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back to talk about how this moment in your life and how you started, like, you know, realizing that you're why and, and how you started living more intentionally to get to where you are today. We have to interrupt today's video to let you know that right now, Restaurant Systems Pro is offering a no strings attached 60 day trial that will help you improve your systems, increase your profit, and find better work life balance. All you have to do is click the link below. We're back. Um, so you have this moment, this realization, you, you get clarity of your why, your purpose to, to share your culture, to share your parents' story. Um, what how did things start happening differently like w did things start accelerating did you like what happened then yeah i mean i would love to say this is a beautiful disney story and it's like <laughs> Bring! Right? i'm the pretty princess now you know it's not um, how it usually works no there was a there was a lull of just us hustling yeah dude i remember um one time i was doing this catering as a breakfast catering and it was like five in the morning it was dark we were at this uh commissary kitchen that like was like super shady and i slipped during the ice it was like a february so it was like super icy i slipped on the ice i fell and right when i was falling i thought to myself and we were hustling we're just hustling right and i just thought to myself please hit your head on the pavement so then you don't have to do this catering today <laughs> you know like that's like but then i was like i have big shoulders so i hit my shoulder first and i'm like no <laughs> stupid shoulders stupid getting shoulder, away my head getting away my head <laughs> protecting my head and i remember i just lay there going what am I doing? You know, um, I got up and, you know, finished the catering, blah, 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 whatever. But I realized that there are these moments, the, these like incredible moments that you're like, bam, they're like stars collide. You're learning. But those don't happen all the time. No. But then, when they happen, you know, it. They're yes. Happening. Then there's gut feeling. Yep. Then there's the there's the hustle. You're in the hustle and the grind. And it's six, seven months. Nothing's really changing. You know, you feel like I created a system, but my system flaws. So then I'm running around to eight different shops just to try to find freaking cilantro. Like, it's just like, what am I doing? Um, but I think in all of that, it like I, I didn't want to give up because they never gave up. Like, it sounds so cheesy, but it was just like, nope, they never gave up. So suck it up, dude. Like finish the dishes. It's two in the morning. Let's go. It's half the battle is showing mm -hmm. up, man. It's, yeah. a, it's one of my core values. It's, one, it's just after. Uh, so we have integrity. We are students. We are educators. Mm -hmm. We are collaborators. We are communicators. We show up and we have fun. It's mm -hmm. but showing up is literally half the battle, and mm -hmm. it's those who show up the most over time. It compounds, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I do want to talk a little bit more about pop ups because mm -hmm. it was around 2016 to 2017. I started seeing this pattern and mm -hmm. the people I was talking to that they got started with pop-ups mm -hmm. and I, I want more people to be aware of the pop-up approach. Uh, why is the pop-up approach? Do you think it's a better approach? Uh, I think it's a great start. Yes. It's not the end all. It's a great start. Which is, yeah, it's a, so uh, there's the approach of working for famous people and tying your, your brand to them and learning under their, you know, yep. guidance and, 
using that to go get a two million dollar loan. Mm-hmm. And there's the start where you can, mm-hmm. and, and and there's nothing wrong with that path. No. A lot of people do it and they have success. But then there's the path of like, I can just start doing this as long as I'm okay not making a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, I can just do what I love right now, but start where I can. Yeah. So uh, what I would say, sorry, man, I didn't mean to interrupt no, you. No, yeah. you're, you're good. What I would say from the pop-up standpoint is this. Don't quit your day job. Very honest. Don't quit your day job and don't go full into a pop-up. Ex- one a week, maybe one a month. Yep. Yep. Yeah. What you get to do is you get to test the waters. Uh, a lot of people who go in the pop-up world comes from two schools of thoughts. They, you know, they work for somebody and they're like, We're, I'm going to go do a pop-up and do my own. Great. That's amazing. But working for someone on a line is totally different than going and doing your own. Right. Because now you have to worry about food costs. Now you got to worry about who you're paying to come, you know. Now you're also got to worry about, okay, what, what am I sell? what am I price point? The business aspect of it. A lot of... Uh, line cooks and you know some chefs who aren't involved in that side of the business man it's great if this restaurant fails like they can go get a job somewhere else right like if this fails and everything goes under like i have my name written to a lot of loans and personal guarantees on a lot of stuff right you know but again it's you know like i tell people don't quit your day job you know if you're a cook if you're a chef who you know working for somebody else Pick those days, the, the day off you have once a month, and you say, hey, you talk to your chef, you talk to your, hey, I'm going to do this here. You know what the best part is? You have all this group of people supporting you. You know, so, the, so some, some of the people that are working with you that have days off too, hey, I'll come help serve. Hey, I'll come help prep with you. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's really fun. So start small. S- Absolutely. Scale over time. What are mm-hmm. some of the other things that you learned over time mm-hmm. that if you just knew from the beginning, it would be a game changer? Uh, I think for me is uh, keep your menu small. Yes. Why is that important? Keep, do your greatest hits. Mm. Do your greatest hits. Uh, you know, any opener for big bands, right? They don't go and do like, oh, here's some new songs we're trying. No, you do your greatest hits, you know, and, and understand that you're in the opener. Like you're not the main act. So it's cool. Do your greatest hits. That's what we did. So we kept uh, the menu to like six items. I was just going to say what's yep. small. It's yep. relative. So six, six items. maybe seven items and be okay with selling out. You want to sell so out. So are these plated or are they like where you do like, like to go only? Yep. Like, So it's a little different now since, you know, COVID and everything. Everyone yeah. has, you know, it's kind of changed the world. But we did when we started ours before COVID. It was the first two was more of like um, smaller plates. I always hate that word, small plates. But, you know, it's smaller plates. And, the, and, the, and then the... Uh, and then two, oh, sorry, the first two was that. Third would be some kind of noodle dish. So if you're coming individual and you want a bowl, you got that. And the last two was like made for two to three. And so we, we kept to that. Which mm-hmm. is big in the Hmong culture, right? Shareables, Absolutely. Yeah. If I had it my way, all six would be that. Yeah. If I That's had it my way, way if I had it my way, it'd be like, you know what? You come here, the pl- you, you have a plate already ready. And you just order, and it comes in the middle. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is we had people that were like, you know, one top, two tops that would come in. We would have people that were, you know, like, oh, I'm just here for a little something, something, you know. And so it's like, okay, we had to feel out the people coming in and, you know, kind of s- so switch that. So beyond – so what are some of the – you talked about the importance of why, mm-hmm. right? Why is a small menu important? Yep. So it's important because, again, you want to show your greatest hits. You want to show what you can do. But the, at the end of the day, you're coming in. It's like you're moving into your friend's couch for the weekend, and then you're leaving. And you're you don't cooking want, dinner on that couch. Yeah, bro, you don't want to <laughs> freaking bring in your you know, 45-inch screen TV. I guess it'd be cool, but what are you doing? Like, you don't want to bring in a, like a dresser. And you're going to – nah, man, you're, you're, you're living out of a go bag. Yeah. And, and that's what it is. So you can fit – you can do – how do you say this? You can do less better. Yes, and – you want to run out, yeah, because it's like, what are you going to do for the? Ne- you for don't want to no bring home? it home with you, yeah, yeah. But, you know, and th- again, there's food costs, you know. And so, so, was your strategy early on to be profitable or just to kind of like, well, like, what was your goal in the first year or two? Uh, to we didn't really have any goals, but in the back of my mind, it was not profitable, and not to be profitable. In the back of my mind, it was like we had to re we had to educate people on what home food is. Okay. So we weren't doing a burger pop up. We weren't doing a pizza pop up. We weren't doing a, like Italian red sauce pop up. We were doing Hmong pop-up, and a lot of people go, well, what is it? What's Hmong food? What is Hmong food? Yeah, so we have two, two – you have the hardliner Hmong people who are like, Hmong food has to look exactly like this, taste like this, right? 
And then you had the other side where it's like, well, Mungfu could be whatever you want, you know, like whatever. It doesn't matter. It's like, you know, it's Korean, it's Japanese, whatever. Well, the right? Mung people were nomadic, right? Absolutely. So it wasn't like that part of the history that they yep. went around and they brought all that stuff together? Yep. So we talk about that. Yeah. We say Mung food is not a type of food. It's a philosophy of food. And what is that philosophy? And so we say that in that philosophy of what Mung food is, that what we always talk about is this idea that when we uh, that when we gather together, we use what's around us. So Hmong food here in Minnesota is different from Hmong food in California a little bit because the growing seasons are different. Right. Hmong food here in Minnesota is a little different from the Hmong people that live in, let's say, Little Rock, Arkansas, because the weather is different. Right. But what keeps us connected is our story. What keeps us connected is there's these little elements if you're not within with if you don't listen to the culture carefully or you're not in the culture, you miss those flavors. So, so that's why we always say Hmong food, like even the, our restaurants, we, I say, yeah, we make Hmong food. But if you truly want to experience Hmong food, you have to sit at the table of a Hmong mom and dad, of a Hmong house. Because we, at the restaurants, we miss all these little nuances. What are the nuances that you get with mom and dad? You would never be asked, uh, can I make a plate for you? We don't believe in making plates for our people when they come in, our guests. You're given a plate, and then you're invited to the table. Mm. You would never be asked, hey, how many pieces do you want? You serve yourself, and whatever you take, you take. The food in the center is not about everyone getting a quote-unquote fair share. It's about everyone gets to sit together. Mm. So as a little kid, I would get mad because there was like, you know, we were, there's four of us kids, and there'd be five pieces, and I would say, oh, it's not fair. And my dad would stop me, and he said, there's no such thing as not fair. And then this is what my dad would say. Dad would say, when you say this is mine, you have less. But when you say this is ours, we have more. Mm. So what does it mean to have more together? So when you, when you come in and mom's making you food, my mom's never, ever going to ask you, uh, hey, sweetie, can I make you a plate? It would be, the, it would be, the, it would be like disrespectful because that means you're limiting what you want to put on a plate yeah. for them. But they invite you to the table. You get invited to the table to sit down and partake in everything that's in the center. Because my mom said that when we, when we were in the refugee camp and we were in the war camps, and it was so poor, we had nothing left. We were able to scrounge up something in the middle and everybody can have a piece. I just love that, that lesson of just the, the abundance mentality mm -hmm. in general. Like when we think of scarcity, when we think all I get is this portion. We guard it. Yep. And, but when we combined our resources, yeah. we can go, we, there's always more together, right? Mm -hmm. And we can always go further together. Yep. I think that mentality is important in business too, not just mm -hmm. on what you're eating at the table, but yep. like when we come together and we combine all of our, our shared strengths and mm -hmm. abilities and experiences and perspectives, the collective, that, 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 that coming together of ideas and skills and strengths, the group goes so much for there's a, there's plenty for everybody Absolutely. you know uh it's just a great lesson in yeah general. and that's part of the philosophy that sometimes coming to restaurants we we it, it seeps through the little holes you know what i'm saying like restaurant at the end of the day it's a business so there's logistical things yeah. that need to go behind you, it you, yeah you get lost you know? in the mundane yeah uh that's the truth and i never claim that we are traditional Hmong food you know authentic that word authentic and traditional we i've never claimed that i say we do Hmong food but we do monk food in the way of like how I grew up. Yeah. You know, I don't think food should be labeled either sometimes, you know, Absolutely. like what is like food is it's whatever you, you bring together. Yeah. And there's so many different renditions of it. I think it was the French that were big on like saying this is exactly what something's mm -hmm. supposed to be. And if it's not exactly like this, mm -hmm. it isn't this. Uh, I've never really marched to that beat. But no, I, no, no, I think I think that being in the restaurant world and cooking, too. Yeah. You really see that. There is no thing that we cook that's like, oh, yes, this has this pure thing that we can trace back to this purity of whatever. It's like, dude, no, like the French took that from so-and-so. And, -so and the, oh, yeah, like, you know, the Spanish yeah. took that from this. And then the, you know, da da da, da you know, like, like pad thai. You know, the pad thai isn't, isn't actually really Thai. Pad thai was a middle finger to the Chinese. <laughs> because there was a lot of Chinese businessmen and companies that were buying up, you know, spots in thailand so so the king of thailand decided that they would take that technique of, of frying noodles yeah which chinese that's a chinese thing and he would take that technique make it into pad thai and then that now is the national dish of thailand so literally <laughs> it's a middle finger to I the chinese <laughs> pad thai 
is not like, oh, like, like, a bunch of Thai people figure it out. No, it was they took the technique and they took the, f you know, you know, the way that they make fried, you know, noodles like yeah. that from the Chinese and did that as an FU to the Chinese. Like, wow. But look that, at, like, look, look, use pizza as an example, yep. right? Like, there is no right way to make pizza. Yeah. In my opinion, some people would freak out at that comment. Yeah. But the best pizza in the world is the best, is the pizza that you grew up eating. Yep. And it's relative. It's mm -hmm. like, it's whatever memories like yeah. that, that, that rendition of pizza brings to you mm -hmm. when you eat it, what, that makes it so good. Mm -hmm. Like, there is no right way. Mm -hmm. There's just the way that you like and other people like, you know? And yeah. Mandalorian style. Uh, this is yeah, the way. <laughs> I love it. So w when did you know to go from pop-up to brick and mortar? What was that transition like? It was really hard because it was like we got a chance to uh, open up at um, Sociable Cider Works, uh, which is a cider brewery. They bought uh, a trailer. And then we put Union Monk Kitchen in that trailer. Okay. So w I should probably bridge yep. the gap a little bit. So you went from um, just doing it like when you can. Mm -hmm. You didn't quit your daytime job. Yep. And then as momentum builds, you started doing more frequent pop-ups. Yep. Uh, was there a middle ground like where, between where you were just doing them randomly to like now you're actually being profitable with the pop-ups and the only thing holding you back from making more money is uh, yeah. a so more we, regular so spot? Yeah, so when we hit that, uh, the, the, the owners of uh, Social Society Works said, you know, we've done a few little things that on – at their place and they're like hey we're, we're we have this you know we want to have food here constantly so but we got this food trailer and we would love for you to like do a residency in it so that's when we're like okay this could be really good for us on a profit wise it keeps us consi uh, consistent so we did that and doing that was the launching to be like okay like we'll you know from here on then we'll do a brick and mortar and just keeping this like like we're like we got this one route this is the route pop up you get to a point where you're big enough. Okay, now we have like, I wouldn't say a brick and mortar, but we had a trailer, <laughs> you know. And then, okay, that's yeah, great. Some level of consistency. Yep. yep. Like a like trailer is a brick and mortar when your life is popping up yep, all over the yep. place. Yep. <laughs> so it was like the next thing. <laughs> yeah. And then okay, and we gather a bunch of things together. Okay, what does it look like to look at a brick and mortar? Uh, and then that's where the kind of the birth of V9 came, and uh, you know it, it was interesting. Uh, we, Mung Kitchen has been always looked at as a. Uh, yeah, that's cute, kid. But when are you have a real restaurant? Like we've been even told, like, yeah, you guys, yeah, you do this little like thing, that's cute. But like, when are you having a real? It was actually said to us, when are you gonna have a real restaurant? Ooh, how did that feel? It hurt, man. I bet. Yeah, it's it's like, it, I don't have any kids, so I can't say that I understand this. But it's like, to be to be completely honest, and the, the kind of the hurt that was like Ugh, in my heart. First, it was like. Dang, man, they kind of like spit on mom and dad's legacy through this, right. you know, because this is how this is how the Hmong people did it. Right. We came to America. We you didn't have yeah. a house. So we slept in couches of, you know, sponsors. Then we got to. The Hmong people were the, the original pop up. Yeah. basically. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you look at this, our story, it's, you know, it's the story of our Hmong people, you know. And it's, it's like, again, I don't have any kids, so I wouldn't understand completely this. But, you know, but it's like when if you, if you have a kid and. You know, the kid has some kind of disability or born with, like, Down syndrome. And somebody looks at you and goes, hey, when are you going to have a real kid? Oh. Like, do you know? Like, that's how I felt. Like, <laughs> or are we not? That was a great analogy. Like, <laughs> like, no, for me, I'm like, are, are we not real? We're doing, yeah. you know, 275, 300 in sales out of a trailer and catering. You know, um, we, we're, we're, we're like, we're, we're, I don't know, I have an LLC. We have a, you know, we have a business. Like, but we don't have these four walls that people can come and eat at. I'm sorry. You know, this is what we this is all we have right now, and it's still like this is great. But when are you having a real restaurant, when are you get this so is what they were saying to you when you were doing it at, at the Cider Works. Yep. So, okay. Yeah. How and long were you there? We were there for like a, almost two years, and the, the goal is to be there for like you know a year and a half, two years. What and was your evolution during that two years? Uh, I started out as a small, you know, whatever, and then we found like we we have our greatest hits, and then we kept to that. You know, we had little grills outside little smokers outside so we grill the meats so this is 2017 to 2019 uh, like 18, 18 18 to 19 18 to 19 and a half and then covid hit yeah and then we had to figure out really quick how to get through the summer with covid well i feel like you kind of were in the a better position than a brick and mortar to have a mobile you know pop-up that you could do outside yeah. yeah so that was the thing so what we saw was our weakness quote unquote well, now has become our strength so the weakness being a pop-up yeah not being a, a real restaurant yeah quote unquote there was quote, unquote. quote quotes yeah, 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 yeah so and then from there on we had a few places that were like hey 
you know, we have a like we have a kitchen, but food's not going well. It's a bar. You guys can run the kitchen. We'll run the drink. So we, you know, had. You, so that was like. Would you, how would you set that up? Would they keep all the sales from the alcohol and you yep. keep all the sales from the food? Absolutely. I like that approach. Yep. So we did that. But then unbeknownst to us, they just closed suddenly uh. without really giving us a warning. So we, we established ourselves in there. It was really, really. It took us about four or five weeks to establish ourselves in there. And then literally the week after they closed. Was this the same the, the cider place or a different place? Nope. Different place. Got it. Got it. And uh, what so was better about this spot than the cider place? Uh, people people can sit down inside at the eat. time when you at were that looking time, at it. Yep, yeah. people can sit down. But we were still the wishy washy with COVID, right? It yeah. was oh, we're closing in di- door dining. Okay, we're open now. Well, we close. Well, if we're listening to this and we're at that point where we've been maybe doing a pop up for a year, mm-hmm. we're, we're getting traction, we're selling mm-hmm. out every day, mm-hmm. um, we're, and we're looking for a more permanent pop up. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the things you learned the hard way in making that transaction, or things you knew you know now mm-hmm. that you didn't know that you could give advice to yourself? Uh, have a s- not a slush fund, but have like like a like that uh that bumper fund what is know? a slush fund uh where it's like hey we're we're transitioning out and it's just gonna co- things so are just gonna cost me. what's up you're buying yourself time yeah so we go room yep so we're just gonna have like we're we just need like i don't know for oh. us it was like 25k okay and to make sure that there's this fund where it's like we're pulling money out of here because it's like Bill's oh, still oh crap paid. yep <laughs> this has got to get paid and oh crap like we got to get this permit now. Yeah. And, and that permit's $1,300, you know, but or whatever. Still, dude, $25,000, like, transition. Like, you could go get a loan for $500,000 and try yeah. to get your... So, I never knew that we could get a loan. Well, no, I'm just saying, generally speaking, if you're listening oh, to this yep. and you're trying to do go straight for brick and mortar, mm-hmm. the cool thing about the pop-up approach mm-hmm. is, it, is, is, like, you can come up with $25,000 mm-hmm. on your own if you work hard enough and you save, and mm-hmm. that can be the step to the next... Yep. To the, you can do it step by step. You don't yeah. have to go all in at once and, and this is what i would tell people too looking back on it is i think again this is something that it happened to us without us not knowing, like there was this wasn't planned dude like this wasn't like this is my our five-year growth plan it was like how do we survive to next week how do we survive to next week i, mean, I remember when i first started i would just pay our dudes in Vemo, you know I'm like, uh, and they just like write down there i was like okay you good on this and i just sent them Vemo, you know like i don't Sorry, IRS, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of the other cool thing about yeah. pop-ups right now. And I'm not encouraging people to, yeah. to for, you know, to do tax evasion yeah. and stuff like that. But when you're young tax and you're small <laughs> um, and you're literally yeah. not fixed, yeah. you're harder to lock down. Yeah, yeah. You're harder to, defi- to follow up yep. on. Like you can, you can, I mean, this is why they regulate things so yep. they can keep tabs on everybody. Yeah. Um, and when you're a pop-up, the, 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 the government really hasn't caught up with the pop-up yet. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not encouraging anybody to break laws. I'm just saying yeah. that if you do, there's a better chance you don't get caught. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what we were just side hustling, and yeah. people would just write us checks too. You know, and be like, okay, thanks for doing my, you know, kids, you know, graduation party. Here's 500 bucks. Yeah. You know, and you're like, okay, cool. And I just put it in the check to make sure that it was never like negative. So when did you know? it go from being loosey goosey to more mm-hmm. serious? Uh, when we took over in the trailer, uh, you know, I found an accountant. Uh, I found a tax person. Uh, we yeah. And so then you th- had this trailer. This is the trailer that you were using at this this place that closed. Yep. And oh no no, no this trailer we were using at Social West Cider Works. Oh okay. So then we moved into this bar. Got it. It was like a bar pub type thing. Did the trailer come with you? No. It uh, Social owns that trailer. We were the resident. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So that trailer is you know right now it's like different people coming through. Got it. So it's a pop up. Yeah, it's a pop-up trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when did you know you were ready to move? What year is it when you moved out of that that pop-up trailer? Uh, 2019, yeah. Like end of uh, October of 19. Okay, and going into 2020. Yeah, we're going to 2020. That was like, like COVID was just like a glimmer of like people talking about it. We go in, COVID hits hard. Uh, oh, no, 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 COVID, no, it was 2020. It was 2020. Yeah. yeah. Okay. COVID already hit. And, and now it's like, okay, it, you know, we've seen the light at the end of the tunnel. So, you know, we, we went in. And, yeah, that closed down right away. And then we found – and then it was Thanksgiving also. So we were doing Thanksgiving kit. And we had, like, 25K uh, in order from Thanksgiving kit. So we didn't have a place to do our Thanksgiving kit put together. So we, like – so was we squatted a, there. Was it going to be a Hmong Thanksgiving kit? Kind of, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We did Thanksgiving, but we put a bunch of uh, Hmong side dishes in there. And we literally – squatted there without anybody knowing and just like did all our like package there after we were done with that uh there was a 
you know, there was like this catering kitchen that we found that we just like did to go catering from there. And people, people were really cool, man. Like people were all about the, you know, getting in supporting. So we did that after we were there for like almost a year, um, Gray's food hall, which, you know, uh, they had an open place and, uh, the gentleman who runs Gray's or, you know, who built Gray's when Gray's are going to was first going to come here. They, we were one of the first people they talked about three years ago, three or four years ago. And we were just like, I don't know if we can, you know, if we're ready for that transition. I'm definitely yet. hitting up this food hall while I'm in town. Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we were like, I'm not sure if we can, you know, we can do that right now. Um, but at this time, we're like, yeah, let's do it. So we implemented ourselves into the, into the food still, hall. Still the greatest hits. Still the greatest hits. We, yeah. so, we, so we created this thing called Zhongxia Miao. The okay. word, word Zhongxia in Hmong means happy. Okay. You know, so happy meal. <coughs> and it's basically, it's a meats and three. Okay. You think about it. You pick a poaching. You know, you get you, you get a hot sauce, you get uh, a, a veggie side, and you get sticky rice. It's a meat and threes, mm. basically. And so we created that, and we said we're gonna we're gonna do this because these are our greatest hits. Keeping that you know keeping that menu small, and then you can get what's called the Gray's uh, Feast, where basically we take a, a rice basket and we line it up with uh, with banana leaves, and then you just get a bunch of different kinds of cuts of meats, food, noodles on there. Mm, man. Yeah, so, so it's made for you know four to. We said three to four people, but it's been taken out by two people. So how did things start to change when you got into the Gray's Food Hall? So we were very blessed. And once we got into the Gray's Food Hall, there was more push on the media side. So there was, you know, you know, national people were interviewing us. Um, when we were out in, like, the last, the last summer that we were at in, um, uh, out in Social Side Works in the trailer, um, Bon Appetit did a whole piece on us. And they, 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 they were like, we are so sorry because the piece came out in the midst of uh, COVID. Oh, yeah. So it was just like, but they did a whole piece on us. And it was like, I thought it was going to be like, a, oh, hey, here's a little side note. If you're ever in Minnesota, you know. So they, they did a couple other little small ones like that. So I thought. And then the, um, the feature editor, she like emailed me and goes, hey, can I get the phone with you? And I'm like, and she started talking. She goes, oh, yeah, it's going to be like right in the center. And you're going to get the cover shot. And I'm like, wait, what? That's so wild. yeah, so we, here we are, uh, quote unquote, on real rest, not a real restaurant, and we have this whole piece that's on Bon Appetit. And but that's, I mean, uh, you can attribute a lot of it because you chose to lean into who you are. At a point in your career, you didn't, you wanted to leave the Hmong out of it, yeah. and I think this just goes to show to be who you are and to Absolutely. own who you are, Absolutely. and um, to I don't know, like to shut that fear up. Yeah. You know? So when that happened, what what happened next was. You know, all that stuff was great. We got a lot of press, you know, went really well. And then when we went to uh, Gray's Food Hall uh, to be in this food hall, um, more, like, national press started coming through, started asking for more, you know, requests and stuff like that. And so, so that's when I was like, okay, I'm, I, I need help sorting all this thing. We had an incredible team that runs the operation stuff. But then, the you know, the PR stuff, I needed help. So we are able to... You know, as we grew there, we were able to, you know, bring on uh, different PR groups that would help us sort things out. Yeah, this is – I want to talk about the PR stuff because I think yeah. that's really important because I think you do it really well. Oh, and it's, a, it's an element it's, – it's so significant that I think today if you, if you have plans to be successful, mm -hmm. a publicist is part of the mm -hmm. equation. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. You need that today. Mm -hmm. um, before we talk about that, though, I, I am curious. Um, I love the idea of a food hall as being another stepping stone mm -hmm. to a brick yeah. and mortar. Because yeah. I love the way you took, you, yep. you know, just like start where you can yep. as the cash flow increases, mm -hmm. as your uh, mm -hmm. access to people increases, mm -hmm. as things are going, you just you just take bigger bites, right? Yeah, so and if you think about how we started as pop-up, it's like we surf, we're couch surfing. And then suddenly when we think of the trailer, it's more like, hey, man, we have like a guest room over here yeah. for you. Yeah. So we went there. And then, the, and then if you look at... Uh, the food hall it was like now we moved into an apartment complex yeah now you have a suite yeah yeah you know, not a suite or like a, like a, a studio like studio suite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah but it's still ours yeah and that's why i tell them i'm like let's be very very clear this is ours 290 square feet in here yeah it's ours yeah we get to control whatever's you're paying in here. right yeah we're paying rent and everything but the cool thing about it is you're not worrying about all the things that you have to worry about with a, a, a standalone brick and mortar like maintenance mm -hmm. what are mm -hmm. the other things that you're not worried about yeah Little maintenance, electricity, within, yep. water. Yep, you're not paying those bills, are you? We are. Okay, we are. Uh, but again, it's it's part of the rent. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, it's uh, it's it's, le it's less to manage. Yep. So it's yep. a great stepping stone yep. if you're a restaurateur yep. and, and you don't have the bandwidth 
to be the back office yet. And you can run it with three to four people. Right. And again, keep your menu small. So what is the deal that you have worked out with Grace? You're paying yep. rent for the space. Yep. Um, what to, like what like what are the parts of a, a restaurant that you that you don't have to worry about? Yep. So uh, you don't like a lot of times it's maintenance. Like crap breaks down. Like if the you know if the the hood goes off, something goes wrong. You know, there's a GM there that takes care of all that. Yeah. You know, and the the food hall's paying that person. Yep. Yep. And that's again, it's all wrapped up in your rent. Yeah. You know. Um, and also, too, is they have a lot of the kitchen equipment that are already in there for you. Unless you want something specific, then you would do it yourself. But your basic is already in there. Mm-hmm. You know? so it's an incredible stepping stone. It is. It is. And there are more and more food halls popping up all mm-hmm. over the place. This, this is an option. This is a pathway. Yeah. And we were, con- we were in control of our own like, um, promotion, you know, uh, PR. So you were in control of your own. So that meant, like, however much effort you put into it, that's you putting the effort into it. So if you're just like, eh, whatever, I'll put a post once a month about, you know, our place in here, then it's on you. So it made me really going, okay, you ha-, like, I switched from being a cook to more like, okay, you have to be, like, the front end of this, you know. You have to be the front push of this. And so to be completely, completely honest, what really, really, really helped us that summer was earlier, last, the spring before that, we were um, – asked to go on Netflix uh, Iron Chef, so to compete on Iron Chef. And it was literally, it was a call, at that, uh, Gavin Kaysen was the, um, he's the culinary producer, so he texted me, he goes, hey dude, these producers are gonna call you tomorrow, pick up the phone. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so you actually worked with Gavin for a little bit. Yeah, that, that, yeah, I yeah. didn't come out of your story. Oh shoot, sorry, that was kind of like the mix into no, the, all yeah, the yeah. little restaurants. All the yeah, 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 yeah Spoon and Stable, yep, yeah. yep, 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 yep. How long were you there? Uh, six months, seven months, that was like when I was, going through there i was just i had this huge health issue and i was like dude like it's not gonna be good you know um what was your do you mind talking about it yeah uh i so i have very i have flat i have flat feet i guess if you want to call it that and so my ankles the the tendon on my ankles weren't uh they were gone so it would just be like it's like your foot and your ankle like you know that knob it's just bone on bone So it was kind of like, a, oh, hey, you have, to ref- you have to figure this out. Like, so walking around, standing up for 10, 12 hours. It's hard to be healthy yeah. when you can't, we have no desire to move because you're so yep. sore. Yep. And then on the other end, too, was just, you know, um, I had stuff with, like, high blood pressure and, you know, like, heart palpitations and stuff like that. So there's a part of me that's like, again, I, I was in a really bad place at that time where I'm like, well, eh, whatever, you know. Uh, and then there was this moment where it's like, you can't do this. You can't go on like right. this. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, that's kitchen life, right? Right. And so I didn't have health insurance. I didn't have anything, yeah. you know? And so I was like, okay, I have to figure this out. Right. You know? Uh, um, did you, I mean, we're kind of going back. Oh, yeah. Was this a, uh, I know, I, I interviewed Gavin for the yep. podcast. So I know that they don't fuck around. Like, that's a legitimate yep. operation. Did you grow as a professional at this point? Or were you too consumed with your uh, health conditions? Did I grow working there? Yeah, Absolutely. Okay. I learned a lot about discipline about you know like how do you ferociously attack something he said discipline was his greatest strength yeah i, I give me an example of how he um, helped you with discipline. uh your station you know clear clear station clear mind you know you say that to us uh brunch making um making the stupid uh, <laughs> hash brown at brunch it's 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 a process to make that hash brown a process it's like 10 bucks for the hash brown and, and it, the, the process is a long process trust me the technique is like incredible. Like I, I like pride myself in making the hash brown now. I was just like, dude, this is so cool. But when you have to make like thirty five of them, and you're like, oh, yeah. And how many steps does each one have? A lot. And you if know, you, if you cut a corner on one step, yep. will it be it, the same yep. hash brown? And he, I think I remember Gavin saying to me, he said, "This is brunch. People can make brunch at their house, but they choose to come here. That's a big deal. Yeah. So when they come here, we want to make sure that when they're coming to brunch, like that." Like, this is going to stand out in their mind. They're going to say, dude, we got to do brunch here again. Yeah. You know, because brunch is basically eggs, potatoes, bacon, ham, whatever. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, basic. Yeah, people can do that at home. Yeah. But they choose to come there and drop good money on brunch. So how do you elevate that? Yeah. Yeah. We're even more of, like, making it so good that, like, it just stays in the front of their minds. Like, oh, brunch, dude, spoon and stable, Sunday morning brunch. You know? Uh, And the other thing he said is – you know, he always says, chef, cook it the way you want them, or cook it the way you, you're, you, sorry, cook it the way you want to eat it. Mm. 
And so I'm just like, oh my gosh, yeah. And so those things stuck with me. And so then, I mean, when we were while, a few years ago, we shot a little like you know TV show together, or a little. And uh, I and I think I quoted him in front of him because he was in there. I'm like, yeah, he used to tell me, you know, cook it the way you. And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, is it crazy? Quote, quote, quote the chef in front of the chef. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that was great for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I did. I kind of just plaster no, over that. No, you're totally. But fine. yeah, yeah. So I learned a lot about that, and discipline was a thing. Yeah. You know. So as you're marching, so now let's let's talk about um, the publicist thing because yep. you said that you yep. know. You have to manage your own, and you we went, we went to school for marketing and PR. You said yeah. too, on top of the communications. Yep. So, what advice do you have for finding the right publicist, and mm-hmm. what kind of budget do you do? You, do you yeah. go all in at once? Do you start a, yep. with a little, and if you do start with a little, what does that look like? Yeah. So, with the success of uh, all the stuff that happened in Iron Chef, and like you know, and it's so funny because I had to remind people, guys, we were a contestant and we didn't win. Spoiler alert for those who haven't watched it, we didn't win. But the producers from there got a whole, like after like talked to me. His name's Chris, and he's like, dude, he's like, you guys, he's feral. Is that where this feral thing? came Oh, from? That, that's a different show. Oh, okay, never yeah, mind. Yeah. <laughs> so the producer there said, hey man, for Iron Chef, he's like, hey man, I've done over a hundred episodes of these. I think yours uh, yours is our favorite one. Wow. And he's like, like we have unanimously voted. And he goes, this is our favorite episode, you know. And so I was like, okay, cool, man. And just the the outpour of everything, especially in the Hmong community, our our community is like when when when, when the community gets behind you, they're, they're behind you. Like Suni Lee wins the Olympics, you know, gold medal. Like it's just like, oh yeah, that's our girl, that's our girl, you know. Yeah. Whoever it is or in the Hmong, Hmong community, if you do something where it's like, it, it gets national international recognition, it's like that's our person, yeah. that's our person, <laughs> you know. It's good and bad things to that, but and then so it kind of just blew up there. And then we started getting more like, hey, I have an idea for a show or like, hey, can you come and be a contestant for this? And it was just so much, so many things. And at that point, too, I, I, I hired on an agent. So, you know, in, in a management team where she helped me suss through all of that. She she knows all the stuff when it comes. You know, she's from L.A. She, that's her world. She's yeah. a shark in a really good way. She's like she's my shark, you know. Yeah. And so she's incredible, you know, Front Foot First, you know, is the name of their production group, their management group. They're incredible, incredible. And they just don't take on anybody, you know. They, it's just like they're really thoughtful about what they do. So, and, and so I started thinking, man, there's so many things going on. I'm saying I, I'm, I'm like a typical monk kid who says yes to everything. And then sometimes it's like, oh, you say yes to something, and it's like, oh, man, like, Literally, that was like an hour of like my time where I'm just like, ugh, you know? So Well, thank you for saying yes. It's <laughs> two-hour long interview. <laughs> no, no, no. This is fun. So, so what I did was we said we started interviewing PR groups, and that's when I was very – like, at first I was like, well, well, I felt like I was selling myself to them. And uh, Lauren, uh, uh, my agent's like, no, no, no. They, they make them sell themselves to you. Yeah. I'm like, what? Like, I could do that? It's like, yeah. Wait, so who the agent told you to do this? Mm-hmm. Was this your P- PR agent for? No, she, she, she's uh, TV media. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Not your PR agent. No, 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 no. The, 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 the PR is the agency. Oh, yep. gotcha, so, gotcha, so, gotcha. So, so Lauren said, make them sell themselves to you. And so, yeah. you know, I talked to a few people. Uh, they're, you know, some very independent people that were incredible. I also love that you took the uh, like you took multiple people like you didn't just yep. find somebody and go okay you do this job yep. like you found the right agency yeah what? we've also worked with different agencies for certain campaigns and stuff like that you know and so I just want to say hey oh this sounds really weird but I'm just gonna say it I didn't want an agency to rep us sounding like white people talking about Hmong people I want an agency to rep us. By allowing us to speak our voice. Mm. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, because PR companies come in and they try to s- tell you who you are. Mm-hmm. And like, you want to spin it like this because this mm-hmm. is going to get traction in mm-hmm. the greater. So they manipulate almost like a, like a, like a video editor manipulates mm-hmm. a, like a reality TV show. Yep. They're trying to put you in an angle and position yeah. you to appear. So they way. get all the rough cuts and then yeah. they're, they're trying to make it into a 30-minute show, yeah. which I get why they do that. You know, we get we have so many facets of what we're doing, and then our PR group tries to do an elevator pitch with it. I get it; yeah. it makes complete sense. Right. But I want us like when I met with these different groups, uh, and I just said, "Hey, here's the deal," like I and that's what I basically said. Like, 
my parents' story is not a brand. You know, this isn't our shtick. Right. If, if you want that, find someone else. Like, if, if you're going to get me, like, if you want us, you're like, you're getting me, and then like, this is my heart. Yeah, if you want this business. Yep. So one of the big things that I always have is that I almost get a little shy letting people meet my parents, to be honest, because it's always, it's so sacred to me. Who they are is so sacred and so special to me. You want to represent them. Why? Yes, but I don't want people to meet them and go, oh, really? That's it? And, and so I'm almost, like, very nervous about it. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't think you realize <laughs> how much your story resonates with me, man. It, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, everything that you said about your parents mm-hmm. and how everything you do is to pay homage to your parents. Mm-hmm. This podcast started because of my parents. Mm-hmm. I started this podcast because I saw how hard they worked mm-hmm. and how much they sacrificed mm-hmm. and, and how they couldn't just have the, the, the securities of paying their own rent mm-hmm. or their mortgage. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Because and, and they had lines at the door every weekend working mm-hmm. in the restaurant industry. And there's thousands of people like this across the country, you know, that work so hard so their next generation can have a better uh, life, right? That's why they do it. Uh, they're going to be episode 1,000. Oh, I'm going to share their story. And it's, yeah. and it's everything that you're saying is the reasons why. Yeah. It's because, you know, like, they're, I, I want to yeah. pay homage to them and to all the other mom and dads out there who work so hard to sacrifice yeah. so much so their kids can get the, the better, you know, life. Go yeah. ahead. No, I, man, like, I remember when my dad told me, I don't want you to cook. I don't want you to work in a restaurant because I, I don't want you to come home and, and your back is tired, your knees ache, and your hands ache. I don't want you to – he said, I don't, I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be better. And, like, as an adult who's, like, 38 now, like, I was like, dude, like, all I want to be is you, you know? Like, gosh, like, man, the closest I feel to my dad is, like, when I'm done working and or grilling and my hands all suited up and I smell like sweat and smoke. That's my dad, you know, like he hustled. Like I, like I hear that in him all the time where he's like, I don't want you to be like me. You know, my mom, my dad always says, I mean, I'm really dumb. I don't know the ways of this world. You gotta be better than that. And I'm like, dude, like you're my hero. Like, like if I can be half the man you are, the kind of father that you are, like, I'm not married, I don't have any kids, but the kind of husband that you are, like, you know, like, he's got no quit inside of him. Like, he's still today, he'll outwork any of us. And I'm just like, I want to be that. And I feel so guilty at times, like, sitting back and relaxing after the day. Like, I feel guilty. Like, I'm not honoring him by not hustling out here. You know, but it's so funny because he's so adamant about I don't want my children to be like me and I look at all my siblings and I'm like we are like yeah. everything that's good the about best us best parts of us yeah. Are good. yeah same thing with my mom you know my mom's like barely five feet tall tiny woman she like she took care of our family man like everything no matter what happened like she took care of us and they both are saying you know we, we, we're, we're really dumb we don't know anything we're, we're simple people we want you to be better I think there's something we can learn from that being, I think there's something in being simple and cause it's in simple, the simplicity of, of knowing what matters. Mm-hmm. When I, th- so when I say simple, I mean kn- knowing what matters, the, mm-hmm. the values they gave you, you know, the things that you said of just taking care of your people and it's about the people and it's about the hard work. Um, it's, it's the culture of and hospitality of, of people just, you don't give you the people take, we share. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's about the collective just start. You yeah. know, just what, what was the quote about in the woods? Just, yeah. just keep Mo- on going, keep moving. moving. Yeah, yeah like, always moving forward yeah, together. Yeah, and, and the, those are the things that matters. And sometimes when we look to the people who have it, right, who have the stuff, who quote have, unquote, yeah, yeah, exactly. You get to know them and what's really going on. And those mm-hmm. people are the most shallow, egotistical, mm-hmm. soulless. Mm-hmm. You know, they're chasing the wrong things. Mm-hmm. And I think it's good that we re- like people like your parents humble us and they remind yeah, absolutely. us absolutely that what matters, everything that matters is right in front yeah. of us. And it's a, for me, you know, what the two questions I get asked a lot is how do you, like, you're so busy. How, how do you keep everything going? And I said, I have an incredible team. We have an, an freaking amazing team yeah. that gets to take care of the home front when I'm traveling or whatever. It's it, we we talk, we communicate. We're like, Hey, this is what's going on. So we have an incredible team too. Um, you know, I'm from a small town in Wisconsin, right? And it's always so awesome to see my old teachers that was find an article and send it to me and goes, Oh my gosh. Like, you know, like it was like, I, I turned on TV today and there you were, you know, it's like, wow. You know? And I love honoring them saying like, 
you were part of that. Yeah, you have You're part idea. of yeah. yeah. Uh, but the and and the question I always get asked is like, how do you stay so quote unquote humble and all these things? And I said, because I know who I am. Yeah. I, I look to mom and dad. I know who I am. They're my they're my they're my lighthouse. They're my shoreline. When I'm in the midst of confusion and storm, I can look and there's this beacon of light. I know who I am. Yeah. So they loved me ever since I was a kid. My father says, I love you because you're my son, nothing else. There's nothing you can do to work your way out of my love, and there's nothing you can do to work your way into my love. I love you. You're my son, period. Mm-hmm. He taught me that at a young age. No matter what you do, yeah, he said, no matter what, how much you fail, your mom and I, we will catch you. We are your home. That's what they said. So I know who I am. So if some award place doesn't give me an award, I'm not like, ugh, I, I don't know what to do. If they don't give me an award, I can still stand in front of mom and dad, and they love me the same. So yeah, vain. Yeah. Even if I get an award, even if, like, yep, our show got, you know, renewed for season three and you're traveling around the world doing all this stuff and people stop and recognize you. I come home and my mom said this. She said this exactly to me today in the car. She said, your, your dad and I, you're our son. That's it. We know you as our son. That's it. Yeah. And once you know that and your foot is planted in that identity, I don't give a turd if somebody says, oh, this food is da, 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 or, oh, yeah, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Whatever, dude. Yeah. Like. I know you need a hug from your mom and dad too. So stop pooping on people, you know. So it sounds like I mean the the the, the things that I, that I wanted just to resurface mm-hmm. your clarity in who you are mm-hmm. and your mission and your values. And once mm-hmm. you honed that shit in, mm-hmm. it sounds like things really started to get to the next level for you. Yes. And you were able to articulate it and communicate. Yep. This is what we're doing. Then you found the team, the external mm-hmm. team, the contracted team, mm-hmm. uh, the, the finding the right people to represent mm-hmm. you and your story because it's so important. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it seems like in like 2021, 2022, things really just like really started to accelerate. <laughs> yeah. for you. We like, were correct very, me if I'm wrong about yeah, it. Yeah, very blessed. Uh, different TV shows, different things that came what through. What was the tipping point? What when Was it finding the right publicist? Uh no. I need a publicist. Oh, is, she, well, is she looking for anybody? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know, my, my thing was I didn't do the publicist and the agent thing until like I was like, I don't know what to do with all this stuff coming in. Yeah. To be completely honest. I mean, again, it's, it's like how we build our business, right? Start small. Like I got to the point where it's like I had to like, like <laughs> so dumb. I set, a, like, I set up an info at hilltribemn.com and it would be like people will send in the info thinking they're talking to like, like our communication director or something like that, but it was me. But I would just be like, you know, sincerely, UHK team, you know, or whatever. What's well, a way to segment emails, right? Yeah. You know, to get it over here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and it was it was to the point where I'm like, I'm like double booking things. I'm, I'm making wrong. I feel like I'm making wrong decisions on different projects. And that's when, you know, Lauren, my agent, came in. And she really helped suss things out. And going through her, I didn't, because I'm, I'm a small town Wisconsin kid. So I'll say yes to anything. And she really be, build that wall yeah. to say, hey, if... And it's so funny when she says it this way because I'm like, <laughs> it's weird. But she goes, you know, she'll, she'll, she'll tag me on these emails and she'll be like, well, you know, Chef Vang, my client, is da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, eh, I can't believe you like giving me that title. You know, and, and so then, then the seriousness of, hey, you're getting compensated to what you're worth became a real big thing, which was like, oh, wow, like I could get X amount for this, for doing this. And with that money it was not like building the kingdom but it was like for example my mom my dad's like "Ah, man our our tiller for the garden is you know dead and it's like four five hundred dollars for a tiller and i love to be able to say i got it dad yeah it shows up in the front steps absolutely this is my greatest joy is that you know is to have this fund my my slush fund we're like even this weekend i was talking to my dad and he goes we want to rent this plot of land to do our garden but it's probably going to be 800 bucks for the summer and i'm like yeah i got it yeah that is hospitality that is hospitality beyond just the food, but just like you said, like you anticipate, you don't wait for people to ask yep. for a plate. Yep. You see the need, you yep. do it, and being able to, yep. and being able to do that for the people who've done that for mm-hmm. you your Absolutely. entire life. So my goal, that's my goal. Man. Yeah, yeah, man. My goal is that like every desire mom and dad has, it, it's not going to be of like, oh, well, we have to think about the kids and make sure that the money. Nah, man. Like the brothers and the sisters, we get together. My dad, my mom wanted this mochi uh, mixer thing, and it's like 350 bucks. It's like a Japanese one, like top of the line. You know, it's like the Mercedes Benz of you know mochi maker. And for Mother's Day, I was like, dude, what is? I asked my brother, I'm like, dude, what does mom want, or what you know, what's been? Doing? He's like, oh, she's been wanting this. I'm like, cool, let's get it. You know, there's no like, let me go and see if we have to move things around. Right. Like, so I want to make it very clear that. I'm able to do what I do, and I feel very blessed in what I do and get compensated well what I do, not because I'm, I'm out here driving Tesla, not at all. 
it, it's because I get to do this for them. It is a small repayment of the life that they live totally dedicated to us. I love it, man. You know? Um, so w- paint the picture of what your businesses are. Today. Yeah. So right now, this is what I get really excited about is we have all these different things, right? So Hill Tribe is our umbrella. It's our mother company. LLC. Hill, yeah, Hill Tribe LLC where we have our vision, mission, values, and goals comes to Hill Tribe and it trickles down. So we have Union Mung Kitchen, which is that Gray's Food Hall. We also have Union Mung Kitchen at the Minnesota State Fair. So if you're from Minnesota, you know the Minnesota State Fair is a pretty big thing. When is it? Uh, it's like the last weekend of August. Oh. Yeah. So it is, you know, literally in that 12 days over, they have over a million people come through. So, so we're, we were, the, we were the first Hmong food vendor in there since the state fair opened 112 years ago. the first Hmong restaurants too? Yeah. Or yeah. in, well, in, in, in the Minnesota. Okay. No, no, there's other Hmong restaurants, but, okay. uh, uh, we, yeah, we, we, there's other great Hmong restaurants around. Uh, and then, so we have that Union Hmong kitchen there. So we, we have a little like a little stall or a little cart at uh, the Twin Stadium, Union Mung Kitchen. Uh, we're finalizing, I think by the time this comes out, it'll be out, but we're finalizing our, uh, our stall at U.S. Bank Stadium with the Vikings. So we'll have, you know, food in there uh, during the Vikings game. So Union events. Mung Kitchen is in four, has presence in four locations right now. Yes, and then we also have retail, which we're finishing up. Uh, our R and D with our co-packers on retail. The noodles, uh, hot sauces. Hot sauce. Set with new hot sauces. Do uh, uh, different kinds of um, uh, uh, seasonings and stuff like that. So we have all that, you know, kind of on that shelf. And then we have V9, which is our brick and mortar that we're building out in Northeast Minneapolis. So that's you know in the process, finishing up a few you know lawyers and real estate people need to cross some T's, dot some I's kind of deal. And I was hoping you guys were hoping for 2022 on that, right? We were, yeah, yeah. but it was probably going to be more 20. I want to unpack that, but keep on going. Yeah, yeah. So so that, and then we have here our Hill Tribe building where we do all our catering and special events from. And then since we have a dining area right here, we uh, do a rotating pop-ups with every financial quarter. So Q1, Q2, Q3, Q1 was Slurp, which was all, uh, it's, a, it's a noodle bar, you know? So we had all these different kinds of noodles. And then Q2 here, we have uh, Mika, which is um, the Hmong word for American. And so it's our uh, collision of two beautiful Hmong culture, American culture. It c- creates this beautiful third culture. We call it Mika. And that's what Hmong people call America. Yep. <laughs> Americans. <laughs> Americans. Mika. I yep. love it. So we're like, da 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 Mika. Like, the American. <laughs> you know? And, um, and that's why we call it uh, Hmong American comfort food. So if you see behind me, like, you know, we have things like meatloaf. We have oh, things man. like spaghetti and meatball. We have a katsu sandwich. We have a burger, you know, because it's us embracing our fullness of being Hmong and being American. Yeah, and so then we got Q3 fired up, ready to roll after we're done with this. Uh, and then, you know, on one end, kind of still under that, uh, you know, um, umbrella is uh, we do, uh, I do Munglish is a little podcast where, again, Munglish is this collision of two different cultures, the Hmong culture and the American uh, and the Western culture here. And uh, we talk, it, it, Munglish is made for Hmong kids that are millennial and Gen Z. And, and I, I firmly believe that we want to create this podcast so that it's for us. Yeah. And we allow, and, and, and other cultures will listen in. And so when we, when we talk in Monglish with uh, our, the guests that we bring in, sometimes we'll, break, we'll go on a five-minute rant in Hmong. Okay. And we're not going to sit there and translate yeah. because we made it for Hmong kids. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or, or sometimes How we'll long talk have you been doing that now? Uh, I think we're, uh, I don't know, like a year in. Are maybe? you monetized with that? No, we got to figure out how to do that. Okay. I'm trying to. Let's talk afterwards. Dude, we do. We need to. I'm try- <laughs> We've had a few people that sponsor and stuff like that, but I, I would, to keep it going, we need to monetize it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, for sure. I, would love I to think you it. guys are on to something because you, you're, what's great about what you're doing is you have a very targeted audience. Yep. So the, tr- the, the challenge is going to be how do we find an organization that wants these yep. people? Yep. So you don't need to have tens of thousands of downloads. Mm-hmm. You can have a couple thousand downloads mm-hmm. an episode. And have a very targeted audience mm-hmm. that I don't know. Maybe it's some type of I, I mean I don't I don't even know yeah, yeah. I don't know your, your culture enough to think about what that could be. No. But uh, so you guys just talk about what it is to be Hmong in America. Yeah, and then and then whoever the guest is, it, I, I dive deep into their lives. You know, of some of the struggles they've had, some of the it, being Hmong in America right now is I think the biggest thing is the sussing. Is trying to figure out like how do I straddle both worlds and honor one world and still live true to myself in another world. Well, I think that's part of. And I'm saying this as a white yep. guy, you know, like a, a, a white American dude. Mm-hmm. I think part of our issue moving forward is that we we isolate cultures. Like, like when there's 
the American culture that we're or American people are fifty percent white, mm-hmm. or, or I think it's like fifty five percent white. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's just more of that culture present, mm-hmm. right? So that's a, like that's like this is how I interpret it at least, mm-hmm. right? And then the remaining forty five percent is everything else, mm-hmm. and I think it's Spanish, African American, mm-hmm. Asian in that order mm-hmm. of uh, maybe and, and then like I might be wrong, but it's approximately mm-hmm. like that. So like you have the micro cultures underneath, and then. How do you? You don't want to give up your culture, your identity, your mm-hmm. pride—the thing that you're prideful of. So you want to you want to hold on to that because you should be proud of that. That's your culture. That's your identity. But it's hard to to, to um, what's the word? Um, juggle that. And if you want any American opportunity, you gotta need to yep. have American culture because mm-hmm. people, if they're gonna hire you, they they yep. want to feel like they're sharing a culture. Completely we're taught, understand. We're taught yep. to hire people who share your culture. Yep. So completely understand. My dad said to us when we were growing up, that's why he said, you don't have to speak Hmong in, the, in this household. My dad always thought forward. He said, you're going to, he said to us, I remember he said, as a kid, he said, you're going to go into their world. You're going to learn their language. You're going to learn their culture. And um, you're going to learn their ways. In a, and he said, you're going to do that. And I'm not going to be able to follow you. Mm. And then he said, but embrace it. Learn their cultures, learn their ways, learn their world, and then bring it back to ours. And, you know, as in bring it back and help our people. And, and I mean, that's like the same thing. Dude. Like when we started doing this, it's like I cooked in a bunch of like, quote unquote, white restaurants. And mo- most people are like, most Hmong people are like, well, why did you do that? I'm like, because I wanted to learn these different techniques. I want to learn how to contextualize. It's about contextualizing. You know, because so sometimes Hmong people, we wait here so long to be dubbed by the majority culture to be dubbed by the white people like, you're worthy i'm like why the frick are we waiting here so long right when we were already worthy right do you see what our parents did do you see what our freaking fathers and yeah. grandfathers did do you see that they were warriors and they fought for a country that would deny them then they would have to fight to get into this country then they had to fight to stay in this country like those are freaking warriors man like so why are we sitting here going are, are we worthy enough like do we get dubbed by this white dude who runs this company and then he gives us proof no the approval was already here. We've already worthy right. enough. So that's why, like, that's why I love collaborating with different, you know, people for, from different walks of life. And I think that's the so I, what I think needs to happen, and I'd love to hear your opinions on this. Is like, I think sometimes I think that if you're not a white person in America, um, you think that unless I'm a white person and I have these values or not the values, but this culture, then I'm never going to be accepted, and, and, and it's systematically broken, mm-hmm. right? Um, the question is, how do we cl- share a collective culture? Mm-hmm. How do we go from like being, you know, all these micro cultures that we're st- t- like staggering between mm-hmm. and just say, Hey, we, we have all these things in common, mm-hmm. all the things you just shared mm-hmm. with us, all the things that every different culture had mm-hmm. to do to get here, to have a, a chance at freedom, mm-hmm. of free will, of autonomy. Mm-hmm. And we start just selecting these things that we collectively share. And that becomes the new culture, the shared culture. Why? I mean, what are you, what's going through your mind as I say? Yeah, like as you're saying this, the only thing I'm, like the big main thing I'm thinking about is like, this is a pendulum swing, right? Yeah. One swings to the side of, we're all too, we're all really different. Let's celebrate our differences. It's just difference, 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 difference. And then everyone feels like, okay, we're talking about all our differences and like, I don't know how to connect anymore. Right. But then it swings to the other side where it just is like the, you know, the, the no one race, one breed, one color, you know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like there's that pendulum, right? Right. And in that pendulum swing, regardless of what's happening in the culture, in our culture, in our time, it just swings. And I, I'm, I'm saying that the kind of what we say in the beginning here was like in our differences, there are commonalities and, and, and we could talk about both. Right. You know? And, yeah. and, 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 and I think that sometimes, sometimes, some of the cultures need to quiet and just listen. And, and, and I, I, I say this as a Hmong guy who have sat with, you know, Hmong elders who have told me, son, the white people are the people you're going to be working for, never working with. You just remember that. What? Yeah. What? How the frick am I supposed to survive in this if that's what my attitude is? But if you believe that, yeah. perception's reality. Yeah. You believe that, then, then we have a lot of Hmong kids that believe that. Yeah. And then they pray themselves as the victim. Well, you know, I'm not going to get anywhere here because, you know, like, it's just white people here. They're always going to be my bosses. Dude, your dad, your grandpa didn't fight this freaking war so that you can just whimper away. Right. 
these are warriors, and, man. But like the one thing that we all have in common is that we all benefit from diversity. Absolutely. And I think that's one thing that yep. we, in, if, if you look in mother nature, mm-hmm. you see this all the time. Whenever there's diversity, mm-hmm life thrives absolutely and i think it's recognizing these things mm-hmm. and saying listen like what what is unique about the situation the world mm-hmm. we live in now is like we get to take all these things that yeah. we're privy to our diversity and our perspectives and we get to bring that together under one roof and say how are we collectively mm-hmm. better so i'm gonna i'm gonna say something that i, I don't know whatever i'm just gonna say do it, it. so uncensored go no for no it. no <laughs> so as a bipoc kid growing up i i know the pains and i know the hurts of what it's like to be you know spat at with racism what it's like to be kicked to the other side for being less than i I, so i know that so i'm not talking from a position of like oh yeah like theoretically like you know blah blah blah. no no no. i we we were and 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 it it sucks a lot you know i'm talking you're talking to the kid who growing up white kids would come and take my eyes and open it up and goes can you see better now oh my goodness and this was like normal recess stuff and i'm like uh yeah and I was a kid, so I was like the only monkey kid. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> but those kids also don't know what giant jackasses they're being. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt. So, so, again, kids are cruel because, yeah, yeah whatever. But it's different. It's strange. For, but that's, cause that shit lives in you yeah, for I'm a sure. while. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm coming from that end. So when some of my BIPOC brothers and sisters starts these, like, you know, BIPOC community groups or BIPOC groups, what rubs me the wrong way within these groups is when we talk about white advocates as if they're the problem too. So for example, I have a buddy who anti racism? Yeah. Or I, I don't know what the label is, but is that the like, term I think it means when you overcompensate where you go I don't know. I've I heard don't, I, I don't know that. the terms. Yeah. But what I know is I have a buddy who's white. He is an incredible dude. He works really hard through his restaurant, through what he does to really, you know, embrace the diversity of where he comes from. But when he tries to get into some of these, you know, like, you know, BIPOC initiatives, especially in the chef world, he gets a cold shoulder. And, you know, we talked about it one day. And one of the toughest things for me is this, is that, like, these, some of these BIPOC groups, some of these, you know, BIPOC brothers and sisters that I, that I have. Is this guy white? Yeah, the dude's okay. white. Yep, my, my buddy's white. But it's hard for him to get in. These yeah, groups. he's an outsider. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's like we've taken our hurt as a BIPOC community. And we want somebody to take that hurt because sin begets sin that begets sin. Hurt people hurt people, I yes. believe. So we're going to hurt some dude here who, who is an advocate, who wants to be an advocate, who wants to say, how can I help? Because, because it's like, yeah, we were hurt once and it look, they look like you, now we're going to hurt you. On top of that, we have become the villain that we are trying to fight. So I, there's this line in uh, Batman Dark Knight, which I really love. Harvey Dent says it, and he says, you either die the hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Right, dude. And I'm like, are we becoming the villain that we tried to fight a long time ago? And so that's why for me, in the things that we do with Hill Tribe, Hill Tribe isn't an exclusive Hmong thing only. You look at all our people, not that many Hmong people. You know what Hill Tribe is? The Hill Tribe was a tribe of people that lived in the mountains of Laos and the mountains of Vietnam and the mountains of Thailand. And the people that lived out there made up all groups of people. But the lowland people felt like they didn't want to interact with them because they're the dirty hill people. They're the mountain people. Laos, I was there like a month or so ago, and I saw the quote-unquote dirty people. Those are my people. Mm. And nobody thought that they would amount to anything. But when the CIA came in and needed warriors to fight for them during the conflict in northern, th- northern Laos, who did they call? The mountain people. Our people, the Hmong people. And it's my, my thing I say to our team is, look at this. We're kitchen people. Most people will look at us and say, you're not going to amount to much, dude. Like, you never graduated a degree, blah, 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 whatever, right? But if we come together, we can prove them wrong. We, right. we come together. We, if we show them what a group of broken people can do, then we, as a group of broken people... When you say we come together, who specifically? The people within Hill Tribe. Got it. Yep. Or whoever in the restaurant industry. Got it. If we come together as a group of broken people we can show the quote unquote unbroken people what we can do. And by doing that, maybe here among the broken, we create a home for the broken to come back in. Yeah. Yeah. That's Hill Tribe. Mm. We, we, it resonates in all our restaurants. It resonates in everything we do. I love it. I love, it too, I, I love the fact that our group is super diverse, not because it was the intention of it. No, it was diverse because I want your story here. Mm. 
you know and you know in the restaurant industry it's a lot of broken people a lot of people with substance abuse a lot of people that made bad choices when they were younger and now there's like they're trying to live in it and they're like uh like me when I'm sitting here and I'm working at this church kitchen, it's a church, the irony of it, it was a church, and I felt that that was my way of paying pendants. You know, for me, yeah. working in the restaurant, starting in the restaurant industry, because, well, I'm not going to mount to much. Right. Um, you said something earlier that struck a chord with me, but I didn't want to cut you short. I, I interviewed Chef Cleophis um, mm-hmm. Heffington. His last name is escaping me, but he's the chef de cuisine at Zach the Baker in Miami. Um, and he was talking about his experience with race. He's a black uh, mm-hmm. African American gentleman. Um, he was saying what he he learned that his the the, tr- the 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 narrative he was telling in his head that because he was black and because it's a white man's world that he would never get the opportunity he never went for the opportunity uh, and I think that's a and I, I kind of heard that in your story that there's a narrative that uh, your the, the generations before you told mm-hmm. you that like you it's 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 gonna be a white man's mm-hmm. world um, I think it's important that we break that narrative yeah. away because from my perspective the door is open the opportunities are there but i don't think people are, are willing to walk through because they don't think that it's actually open yeah. they've, they've convinced themselves that there aren't opportunities so so the way am i, I wrong in saying that well in a way uh yes please and no. correct me yeah, yeah. so i think that there are two there, there are two things i look at it one i think that the opportunities are there but to even get to to stand in line for the opportunity Sometimes you don't get in line. Like you, sometimes you don't get to be in that line for the opportunity, right? I think the other thing is the opportunity is there, and when you get in line and we get up to the opportunity, right, it's kind of like, crap, no one looks like me. So I don't know. Like I have all this feeling, well, yeah, all these things. You don't feel like you belong. Yes. Okay. It's scary both ways. Yeah. It, it's always scary. My thing is this. I, I go, hey, if you can, like, for example, you know, we've been very blessed to get this show, Feral, you know, Outdoor Channel. Uh, we're right now filming through season three. You that's know? so crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we haven't even talked about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so very blessed. I'm sure that's going to help the brand. It, <laughs> yeah, in a way. It, it's really fun um, to do it, but it was like, did the opportunity, like, just show up randomly? No. You know, I, I did a couple other little things that built up to it. Yes, but those other little things, to be completely honest, it was it – was, white producers who go we're gonna step outside of our comfort zone or not i'm gonna say comfort zone we're gonna step outside of what we know and we want to look for something different so there there are people who are advocates of saying hey we want to look for something or people who are saying hey i I, we want to see beyond the story here you know beyond the typical whatever story right yeah so we there's been a conscious effort to to try to diversify media yep and and not out of sense of like this like oh yeah we have to because this is what we do we have to because it's what people want us to do but is definitely because of this idea of, hey, like, we, we're really curious. Like, one thing that's really great is, like, the, the curiosity that comes with it is the whole idea of, like, they're storytellers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you, you get it, it's man. It's a whole like, vertical that's untapped yeah. for them. There's a storyteller, and you want to work with these storytellers, you know? Um, and so, so I've been very blessed to have that. Now, the other end is once you get there, what are you going to do with it? You know? So, for example, for me, it was like it started out with me just literally doing like a, you know, dump and stir, like a little cooking gig. Yeah. And it was just listening to producers going, oh, okay, hey, man, I understand that you're cutting this or, or doing it this way, but I need you to look at the camera when you do it. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And for me, I have this like, for me, I have this like, ver- like ferocious thing inside of me where I always want to learn something I don't know. I just want to learn it because it's just like my dad, his brain, he works like a reverse, like he has, he can reverse engineer anything in his head and then rebuild it. That's, he's just really good at that. In a way, I'm kind of like that where I'm like, I want to know how that works. Yeah. I want to know how to, how to be a better TV host. I want to know, you know, production. I want to know why it's done this way. Or I want to know when you talk about, oh, that's your two shot, that's your three shot, and that's your one shot. What, is, what do you mean by I that? I don't even know these things. Tell yeah. me because I'm yeah. clearly <laughs> learning too. So, so instead of me just going on set and being like, oh, whatever, I'm like the cook dude. I'm like, I love standing right by the DP and understanding the kind of shots he's taking. Because then when I'm in the scene, I know director like. Director of production? What's up? DP? Yeah, director of production. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Director of production, or then, or the director, or the showrunner, or the producer saying, "Hey, this is what we want to talk about." Then I know when I'm in the shot, I'm going, "Oh, like if I move it this way, he's gonna, he's, I'm gonna be cut out." So instead of me like him going, "Okay, hey, yeah, can we direct you back?" I'm already standing in that position, and and it just makes the 
sh uh, shooting smoother, the production smoother. And again, all that stuff is a technical aspect, but then like when I'm talking to the guide, I'm a monk kid talking to some dude named Dusty Crumb from the Everglades, and we're about to go out python hunting. Right? I'm talking to Dusty Crumb. Dusty Crumb knows nothing about monk people. Dusty Crumb, you look at him, and he is the Everglades, right? Yeah. But I get to talk to him about monk food. Mm. So you know, at the end, he goes, man, I'm just a hillbilly, and you guys are the hill people, so we're just a bunch of hillbillies and hill people <laughs> sitting, hanging out together, cooking together. I get to share with him about how my father fought for this country and came here, and he's a true patriot and an American. I get to share with this dude who probably, we probably wouldn't be sitting in the same bar together. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what I love but about the show. food brings people together. Absolutely. And that's what I love about the show. And that's what I love about the shows we get to do is constantly meeting people. And then people go, wait, so tell us about your story. And then we connect with our story and then we're cooking food together. So are you out finding these people who are the hunters of these indigenous, or not indigenous, but um, what's invasive. The invasive, thank you, um, species. And then you, you get the species and you say, <laughs> how do I chop this up and cook it up? Yeah. Are so they helping you with the recipe or is that all? No. You? So, so I, I come in with the recipe already, you know, but then they show me how they cook it and then I do my own. I mean, this is, I think this, with the amount of invasive, invasive species there in this country, I feel like we could feed people for free. So, yeah, so, so we say it's invasive species, species that are detrimental to the environment they live in, or just species that most people won't have on their dinner or, table. Yeah, species yeah. that are a problem because there was another species that yep. kept them in check, Yep, like white-tailed deer or yep. something like, like that. For, yeah. yeah, so we have an episode with white-tailed deer. Yeah. You know, uh, you know uh, we just finished season, uh, or we just started season three, so we have uh, alligator gar. That was pretty rad, dude. Oh. It's freaky, man. What is gar? Gar is like a long fish. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it yeah, looks. Yeah. It's like a freaking prehistoric looking oh, fish. Oh, they're down in Florida. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, like like Florida, Texas, in the bayou area. Are you going to do an episode on all those freaking fish in the Mississippi that like fly out of the water? When you we drive? already did that. What is yep. one of those things uh, called? It's called kopi, but kopi. it's a... Yeah, kopi, but it's a, a, a Asian flying carp. Yeah. yeah, we just did that. That one will come out in the fall. Yeah. Yeah, that one. I mean, that, it, it was crazy to watch. The fish that. that are in that river could f solve the hunger dude, problem. Dude, we we <laughs> broke that down. It was. They're crazy. not the. I heard they're not the best eating though. Yeah, actually, they're not bad. If I if the you way we make doing. it and didn't tell you, you think you're having like perch or sunny or crappie. Right. That's yeah, it's, it's lake fish. You know? Dude, I'm looking at the time. We're almost at two hours. Oh, so sorry, it's, man. It, no, don't be sorry. I'll go another hour if you yeah. want to, but I'm not going to do that to you. Um, but is there anything we didn't discuss that ha did not come out of mm. your story? Before we go to the speed round, no, nothing really. I mean, you know, it's it's you know, we always talk about what we do. There's you know complexities in what we do, but at the end of the day, like, you know, what we do is it's it's about the food and yeah. it's about the gathering of the people around the food, and then we have been very blessed to do these, you know, media stuff. You know, been able to you know do TV stuff, been able to do podcasts. Like we're very very blessed to be able to do that. Yeah, you also have white rice. You didn't mention that. Oh yeah, uh, well, yeah, white we, on we, rice. Sorry. Yeah, white on rice. So we don't do that anymore. That was kind of like the first one. You know, um, that one was fun, you know, getting to know the community, getting to know the Twin Cities people yeah. here. Uh, but y that one kind of got replaced with um, uh, Munglish, you know, okay. where it's like more focused, you know, and I felt really just passionate about talking about, you know. So one thing I just want to reflect, I just want to reflect, man, mm -hmm. and like what I really like about what you're doing, it's, it's authentic, it's real, you're genuine, you, you, you know what matters. And you don't let people influence what matters to you. You're very grounded to the <laughs> I think that's something that we can learn from you. I also love your diversification and your non-traditional approach to getting started. Mm -hmm. And I think I want to make sure my listeners, if you're, if you're looking to open a restaurant and you're trying to find a capital to mm -hmm. get your brick and mortar, consider this approach. If you are passionate enough about it to show up with where you just start, mm -hmm. and if you have the passion... You'll be able to get there as long as you keep showing up yeah. over time and you get better and you, you start where you can and you like get a little bit better yep. every time, every time, every time. And then the other thing, too, is it, like I love with with um, Union um, Mong Kitchen, you you have four locations and none of them are a traditional location it's in terms of brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. You know, like y there are resources at your disposal. If, if you can develop a strong brand today. Mm -hmm. You don't need brick and mortar. You don't need mm -hmm. physical things to grow because there's digital assets. There's yep. there's other ways to grow and other things you can do to monetize. And you're mm -hmm. you're on your way to do that. And I think that this the way you're seeing things is a very modern way to think about where the opportunity is. What what's going through your mind? Is yeah, this? like it's so true. Like I, this is what I say. If you if you want to start, if you're listening. You're like, man, I want to start a pop up. <coughs> I want to start this food stuff. I say you start it and you do ev you work every position. Yes. So you know. 
And also, there's only three positions, so it's yeah. not that hard to do. <laughs> and also, on top of it, yeah. make make it. It sounds really weird and counterintuitive, but make it hard for you, because you want to put yourself in a position where it says, "On my hardest day, on the toughest day, this will be the toughest day ever." You know what I'm saying? Like, like it was like it was so cool to be like, dude. The first time that I didn't have to answer my own email, I was like, "What is this?" It gets easier. It only gets what? easier. You know, and like. Yeah. Our, our, our director of uh, of catering and you know and special events, she like, okay, chef, here are four things that we got requested. Is there anything in there that you think that we shouldn't do? And I'm like, whoa, I used to have to think about those four things, right? You know, but like she like funneled it into four, yeah. You know, and so so it's like, I so I love the fact that it was like it used to be so hard, and it gets a little easier and a little easier. And there's this quote I heard from a football coach. He says the one percent. He tells his guys, we go on the field today. We're practicing, boys. 1%. You have to just get 1% better. Every, every day. Yeah. I, I'm not asking you to be the best today. Yep. 1% better. So if it's mean working on one little technique, if it means working on your get-off, if it means working on your pivoting, on your sprint, if it means like for alignment, making sure you're getting your hand under that pad, 1%. And that's kind of what we did. We're just like, okay, 1%. It all compounds. Absolutely. Yep. And so that's, yeah, that's what I would say. And, and in that whole thing where it's like, just do it. You know, Nike took the, took the line, but just do it. Just, just go. Yeah. Just start. You know? And if you're going to fail, fail. Yep. Failure is not what we should avoid. Failure only tells us like, hey, man, that didn't work. Let's, you know, come back, refigure that out. Yes, man. I love this conversation. Yep. Jeff, thank you so much. One more quick break to thank our sponsors. We're going to bust out a speed round. Cool. We have to interrupt today's video to let you know that right now, Restaurant Systems Pro is offering a no strings attached 60 day trial that will help you improve your systems increase your profit and find better work life balance all you have to do is click the link below okay. we are back and the first question i have for you for you is what is your it factor a habit a trait a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success oh my gosh like one word only right yeah. okay um i mean i guess it's pretty obvious but i would say parents mm. you know parents mom dad that's one that. that's two words but yeah what is your biggest weakness um self-doubt mm. you know fake it till you make it kind of deal yeah uh if, if you resonate with that answer if you're listening to this three books the practicing mind fully engaged and it's just a thought by uh tom sterner just recently had him on the show mm -hmm. a lot of the things you're talking about just starting mm -hmm. it he gets into the psychology of that it's super powerful uh, what is one question you ask or thing you look for when you're growing your team? Um, drive. How do you know they have drive? Yep. Like, how do I know? Yeah. Um, oh, this sounds really bad. It's probably not the best thing for working, but it's like you don't turn it off. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, but but I, I, I know that there's a lot of work-life work, work -life balance kind of whatever. Yeah. But, yeah. Share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team, a way to be, a way to act. Um, integrity mm -hmm. and this is what I mean by integrity integrity comes from an old medieval uh, word that they used the word integrity back in the medieval time they used it as a it was a, a iron working a word for iron working so basically you put the metal you put it in the hot hot fire and it gets red hot and then you take the hammer and you try to hit the hammer to mold the metal right but if that metal broke while you're hitting it they would say the integrity is weak so I, when I say the word integrity, what I mean integrity is how you act in the moments of hardship in the hottest, hardest time. Do you stand strong and not break when that hammer hits you, or do you break? Mm. That's what I mean by the word integrity. I love it, man. Uh, what is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? So something that's common within the four walls of your restaurants or your pop-ups, but not common throughout the industry to go above and beyond guest expectation. Um... I would say listen, like listen to your guests. Like what are they really, you know? And, and, and when I say listen, I'm not mean talking about just like verbal listening. It's all about the nonverbal, right? Yeah. Most people walk up to our menu board, they haven't been here before. Right. So the listen by l watching their nonverbals. Right, body like, language, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. posturing. Yep. Like and you mirror, know that. Mirror, what is it, mirror? It's not like, mirror, I can't think of it. Anyway, keep going. Sorry. No, but you know how like when you walk into a, um, into a restaurant, you open the menu, and you're not sure what anything in the menu is, and you're just like, Ugh. 
how do you help our guests to be comfortable? Yes, I love it. Uh, I pass over this question, so I'm just going to ask you now. What is your biggest challenge today? Money. How are you <laughs> overcoming it? Um, embracing the reports that our CEO gives us. Um, my college mentor always said to me, reality is your friend. Mm. And getting these budget reports and getting these, you know, um, all the, like the money aspect, like spreadsheet, I used to be like, eh, you know, but I embrace it because that's reality. Yeah. Reality is your friend. We can talk l- great about expanding and half a million dollar, blah, 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 blah. But if we're not literally looking at this, this is our reality, this is what we have on cash on hand, then we're, that nothing's going to happen, you know. What is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or a restaurant owner? Um, shoot, I totally forgot. The, oh, so I just got to, I don't have time to read, so I listen to books. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm a huge um, audiobook listener. Yeah, yeah. In the Weeds. Okay. Uh, it, the dude, Tom, I forget his last name, but he was, uh, he was the director, producer for Bourdain. And so his whole thing was... Um, his whole thing is about he gives you a a look in the life of Bourdain and it's not a sexy life you know and it's really really good yeah um it's called in the weeds around the world and behind the scenes with Anthony Bourdain by Tom Vitale Tom Vitale yeah 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 and uh I'm no I'm no Anthony Bourdain but as somebody who travels the country to Mm -hmm. get interviews and to talk Mm -hmm. to people I I that lifestyle it's not yep. all glitz and glamour. No. When you're constantly going and you're alone in strange places. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't read this book or anything, mm-hmm. but I, uh, when I watched the documentary, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, shit. I kind of can relate to yeah. Anthony Bourdain a little bit. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I'm no Anthony Bourdain. But yeah. No, I get it, man. Like the same thing. I, I say I'm, I'm no Anthony Bourdain, but I, we travel for our show yeah. a lot and you know, go to different places. For, and some of, those, some of those hotel rooms, like you, you, you shot the best episode. You're like, what the frick? Yeah. That was amazing. And you go in that ho- those hotel rooms are super lonely. Yeah. And it's dark. And you don't have anybody to share it with. Exactly, dude. You know, and be like, oh, my gosh. Like, I think I did a really did good job. Did it really happen if no one else was there to yeah. witness it? Yeah. And the production guys, like, they're great. But, you know, it's like they're constantly working. So after we're done breaking down production, they're going back to the gear room. And, and they're, you know, unloading, you know, production. Moving, moving yeah. files around. Yep. Charging yeah. batteries. Yeah. Dude, I and get so it. And so I think a lot of friends think, like, I just go to these different places and go to all these amazing restaurants. Like, nah, dude. You get room service order, or we're ordering from a place down by the street. It was like soggy tacos and stuff I like that. I had Chipotle last night. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. But on top of it, too, you, you, I think Tom holds nothing back about Bourdain because I think Bourdain is seen as two kinds of person. They're seen as the god. Right. Anthony Bourdain, the god. Which ev- like almost every young cook is like, oh, my gosh, that's our guy. Or he's seen as this evil villain. You know, it's just like, oh, like he he monetized and manipulated all these platforms that he used to poop on. Right. You know? Yeah. And so you, you see that. But then, man, it's I don't know. I, it's incredible. Right. Great. I have not read that one. I got a lot of writing to do or driving. So yeah. li- that, that's an audible, too. Yeah. Yeah. Sick. And he re- uh, Tom Vitalio reads it himself. I love when that happens. Uh, all right. What is one thing you feel restaurant tours don't do well enough or often enough? Um. I mean, it's not one word, but I would say, and I'm included in this, I'm saying, uh, ask yourself the question, what does my community need? Mm. And not like, what does the Hmong community need? Like, what does the community here in the uh, Uptown need? What does the community in North Loop need? You know, when we open our place in Northeast, what does this community need? And be, and be the solution? Be part of the solution, yeah. I would say. Be part of the solution. Be the change you want to see in the world. Sure. So yeah. that's T-shirt or something like that. And it's a little Gandhi quote. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is one piece of technology you've recently adopted within the four walls of your business that's having a huge impact on communication, efficiency, profitability, anything along those lines? Slack. Ooh, nice. <laughs> How are you using it? How has that impacted? Uh, so we, we have different uh, re- kind of like um, conditions of returning messages. So it's like if it's email, 24 hours. It's you know Slack. It's this amount. It's text this it's call like if it's a call like right away like esp yeah you know but a uh, slack has really helped build like if it's a slack thing it's like that's a work thing you know and we're, we're talking about work owning on slack you know um so so if it's a text thing it's like oh it could be personal or it could be like a hey quickly whatever yeah you know the slack thing, thing is like organization of uh 
all the different things we're doing. So, so honestly, it's like because all these different avenues we yeah, have. Yeah, it's, it's segmenting yep. the, the conversation. Yep. So you don't have to go searching in like yep. oceans of context yeah, and yeah. text. It's, it's in this thread. Yeah. yeah. But it's funny because it's like we're a restaurant people, dude. Yeah. <laughs> to use Slack, it's like that's what 3M and Target uses. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's a great tool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're like restaurant And it's free people. to use at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, eventually, you have to pay for it. Uh, next question is what is one th- – oh, sorry. Did I miss one? Jared, you know what to do. Editor is great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. This is actually the last question. Okay. Are you ready for it? If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure with the exception of three pieces of wisdom you could leave behind for the good of humanity and your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be? Um, I would say... Know where you come from. One. Unconditional love. Two. And then three is would be uh, redemption. Like nobody's ever too far from not being able to be redeemed. I love that. Yeah. Awesome. Like the, the nerd side of me, I think about, I heard it once said, uh, the comic book nerd inside of me is the reason why Batman doesn't kill people. He beats them up pretty bad. But the, ba- even the bad people, he doesn't kill he them. He doesn't use guns. No, he doesn't. Yeah. Because he, the reason why is... Batman still believes that everybody's redeemable. I love that. And uh, it's just this, this hit thing where I just, I think my parents really showed that to me. It's like, no matter what happens, like you're our son and you always have a home. Mm-hmm. And that, because people fear, like, oh, when, they hear, when people hear that, they're going to take advantage of it. I'm like, that's your fear, man. Yeah. But when I hear that, there's this hope. Hope. Yeah. Redemption is hope. Yeah. And if we can't, if we can't talk about hope, in the crappy world we live in, like, what's the point? What is a leader? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I heard this from, from a, a, a professor of mine. It, mm-hmm. It's a dealer of hope. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome stuff, man. I've loved today's conversation. You are great. Uh, we wrap up every chat by calling somebody out. Who's somebody you respect and admire in the restaurant industry? If you found out there were guests on the show, you would absolutely be tuning in. Who is that person for you? Uh, da, da, da. Alex Robert. Alex mm-hmm. Robert. Where is he based? Uh, she? Yeah. Uh, Alex is um, uh, Alma Brasa. Alma yeah. Brasa. Yeah. Maybe so we he's can connect while I'm in town. Yeah. Uh, awesome. And how can we connect, man? If we really enjoyed today's conversation, if we were inspired by today's mm-hmm. conversation, maybe we want to do our own pop-ups and maybe you might mm-hmm. be able to offer us some advice. Uh, what's the best way to connect? Or maybe we want to come work for you. Yeah. So probably Instagram is the best. Yeah. <laughs> he, he does respond. That's how I, I reached I, out. Oh, yeah. I, I yeah. do or do respond. Uh, I would say, yeah, Instagram at uh, – you know, at Hill Tribe MN, uh, or at Union Monk Kitchen, or my personal ones like at Yevang yeah. Seven Zero. And so this yeah. is a uh, episode one hundred. Sorry, one thousand and two. Head over to restaurantstoppable.com dot com slash one thousand and two. We'll have a summary of today's discussion over there, as well as any links to tools, services, or books recommended, and how to connect with Chef Yevang. You are awesome, Chef Ye. Uh, really, I enjoyed today's conversation. Thanks, Eric. Man, thanks for coming by, bro. Now that's where I say there is no questioning. You are unstoppable. (laughs) Thank you.